Thank you. Next item of business is a debate on motion 22711, in the name of Colin Smith, on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19. can invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request speak, speak buttons now. Now, Colin, Colin Smith, to speak to move the motion. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, in moving this motion, can I declare an interest as a proud member of a trade union? Last week's decision to slam on the brakes and, in some cases, move into reverse and the easing of lockdown is a sobering reminder to us all that COVID-19 has not gone away. Bold talk of eradication has been replaced by a realisation a realization that until we have better treatments, a vaccination restrictions on our everyday lives will be with us for some time to come. And in everything we do, our thoughts should never stray from the 4,236 lives lost to coronavirus in Scotland, a terrible toll contributing to one of the worst death rates from COVID-19 in the world. The challenge for us all, and one we will face for many months to come, is how do we battle this pandemic, but also deal with the impact of the actions we take to do so? Because, presiding officer, while COVID-19 is an appalling health crisis, sadly, it's also becoming an economic crisis. And there are few sectors where this is more profound than aviation. It is one of the first to feel the effects of COVID-19, and it's on track to be one of the last to recover. And without intervention, it is at real risk of collapse. It's difficult to overstate the damage this would do. The loss of employment, the impact on communities, the cost to Scotland's wider economy. Scottish aviation supports more than 20,000 jobs. It contributes more than £837 million to the Scottish economy in GVA. And on top of that, Aerosmith provides, Aerospace provides close to 8,000 jobs, many of which are in jeopardy as a result of this pandemic and a response to it. Analysis by the Fraser of Allender Institute for Unite the Union found that the knock-on impact of the already proposed 2,700 job losses in the aviation and aerosmith sector in Scotland would mean a total loss of almost 5,000 jobs, 5,000 livelihoods, 320 million lost to our economy. A direct loss of jobs alone is devastating enough for the families involved, but the consequences go further. Scotland's aviation is key to our economy, supporting sectors like tourism and attracting inward investment across the country. It connects Scotland to the rest of the world. It provides vital transport links within the country, in particular for our island communities. COVID-19 may have halted business as usual, with air traffic down by around 90 per cent. But even during this pandemic, aviation has kept going, keeping communities connected, delivering those vital medical supplies the PPE, the testing equipment, helping keep the shelves in our shops full, bringing people home as lockdown took hold. And it will have a key role to play in rebuilding Scotland's economy. But, presiding officer, without a sustainable sector, that rebuilding will take longer and it will be more difficult. <clears throat> now, I know those of you that helping aviation through this pandemic is somehow at odds with our climate change ambitions. Transport continues to be Scotland's most polluting sector, with pollution levels now higher than they were in 1990. And although aviation contributes around 18% of Scotland's transport emissions, compared to almost 70% from road transport, I agree there is an urgent need to reduce emissions from aviation. Just as there's an urgent need to enforce the use of greener buses, to phase out, not bring in 40-year-old diesel trains, to make electric vehicles affordable for those who have no alternative to the car. Reducing emissions across all forms of transport, including public transport, is essential, and that requires targeted investment and enforcement and meaningful long-term change in the way we travel. Singling out aviation in that debate may be a convenient scapegoat, but whatever size you believe the sector should be in the long term, however much you believe it should be smaller, allowing a global pandemic to destroy aviation, to wipe out thousands of jobs of ordinary workers right now in the middle of an economic crisis is not a just transition to a green economy. <clears throat> I'll take an intervention from Mike Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. Can I congratulate Colin Smith for identifying in his motion exactly what the Scottish Government should be doing. I'd like him to comment on the so-called quarantine that we have, which in my view is totally useless and so dangerous as we fail to track those arriving at our airports that could have COVID. Germany tests all arrivals 
tests again days later and keeps track of arrivals. The answer is not quarantine for our aviation industry, but test, test and test again. Colin Smith. I thank Mike Rumbles very for that very pertinent point. The reality is the current process, and I'll detail and a bit more uh, late, uh, later what I believe the alternatives could be, is simply not fit for purpose. And the reality is the reason why the government have gone down the route they have, rather than having testing, which is a, a, the real public health solution, is because the testing regime, frankly, isn't fit for purpose, and they can't put that in place at the moment. As Mike Rumble says, countries Germany, France, Italy, Greece, Iceland, all have systems that have testing at their heart to tackle that particular problem. And the reality is that's what Scotland's airports are asking for. It's what Scotland's aviation workers are asking for. Those key workers need our backing and they need our backing now. So that's why Labour is clear that when it comes to support, that support to our airports and aviation companies, any investment made by taxpayers cannot just be an unconditional bailout towards those companies. It should have strings attached to support moves to a sustainable, greener, more socially responsible sector. And crucially, it must be provided on the basis that jobs, pay and working conditions are protected. So that's why Labour are leading calls for UK legislation to end the scandal of fire and rehire on poorer conditions across all sectors. Fire and rehire tactics are simply wrong. They punish good employers, they hit working people hard and they need to end. I was proud to stand side by side recently with Unite members when they came to Dumfries as part of their campaign against the British Airways betrayal. A company firing all its 42,000 staff and rehiring those whose jobs haven't been axed on inferior terms and conditions of employment. I've stood side by side with Prospect Union as they fought for their members at Presswick Aircraft Maintenance Limited, ironically based at the Scottish Government-owned Presswick Airport in my region, as the company shamefully sacked workers when they refused cuts in wages of 50%. I've listened to the GMB members told in June... I'll take an intervention from... Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> Smith, I'm just... He talks about... Uh, um, fire and rehire, but I don't see any uh, mention of Gavin Newland's MP's bill in the House of Commons on that particular issue, which of course uh, Labour in the Commons is actually supporting, or, or any mention of that in your motion at all. I, 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 have to say to, I have to say to Kenny Gibson, as Keir Starmer made absolutely clear in his address to TUC, we fully support an end to hire and fire. But the challenge for the Scottish <laughs> Government is... The challenge for the Scottish Government is there's no point in SNP members at Westminster saying they're opposed to hiring and firing when the Scottish Government happily hands over substantial sums of money, and for example, business rates through one door, when those companies are handing out redundancy notices through the other door. <laughs> now, I've listened to, 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 to members who support those that end into um, the, the hire, fire and rehire, and GMB members, for example, told in June by Swissport at Glasgow Airport their jobs were going to go, telling me that they warned the Scottish Government in March that this was likely to happen. So today this Parliament can stand side by side with all of those workers, including those in our own constituencies and regions. We can come together, we can say enough is enough, recognise the urgency of the crisis. And the Scottish Government can commit today to working with the aviation sector, working with the trade unions and all stakeholders to agree a package of targeted support. Yes, that action should include making the case for an extension of the jobs retention scheme, or rather a new scheme, um, a, a day that doesn't go by, frankly, when Labour do not make that particular case. But we do need a follow-up scheme that isn't used, in the words of Unite the Union, as a state-sponsored raid on terms and conditions, a subsidising of the cost of redundancy by abusing the jobs retention scheme, reducing members' payments, and despicably pitting worker against worker through an effective fire and rehire proposal. And that principle, as I've said, goes for any support the Scottish Government provides. They need to attach conditions that protect jobs and protect workers' conditions. We've seen that when it comes to support conditions being attached. For example, the bus sector, the Government tell us that that has a condition to say that routes must be protected. So why can't we have targeted support at the aviation sector that protects jobs? President officer, the clock is ticking for this support. Well, there's much in the amendment today from the SNP we support. Like the Scottish Government's response so far to this crisis, it's too half-hearted and it does lack urgency. And back in July, in letters to unions and airports, the Cabinet Secretary committed to, and I quote, to work with airports on a route recovery strategy. He claimed to be, and again, I quote, establishing a number of targeted group discussions to take forward initiatives where the Scottish Government can provide such support. Three months later, 
we've heard nothing. So I ask Michael Matheson today, on behalf of those trade unions, when he responds to Labour's motion, will he give a personal commitment to meet with the aviation sector trade unions, which he's so far failed to do, to, do, to discuss what more can be done to support the sector? Will he tell Parliament, the Cabinet Secretary says it's not true, and I'm sure he can answer that when he does, when he does, does that, because the trade unions, the trade unions, the reality is, Cabinet Secretary, the trade unions have made clear you have not supported, you have not met with them to discuss a package of targeted support to support that sector. You failed, you failed to, you failed Excuse to deliver that Excuse me a wee minute, don't just support. have a wee private debate, we'd all like to hear it, thank you. And I would like to hear the answer to the question, will the Cabinet Secretary meet with the unions to discuss targeted support? And, and will he also tell Parliament, and more importantly those workers, when his targeted group discussions are actually going to begin? Because he promised he's in July, and so far we've heard absolutely nothing. Everyone in this chamber, the unions, the airports, the members of this chamber want to work with the government to find solutions, but we do need, frankly, the Cabinet Secretary to step up to the mark. The Cabinet Secretary also says in his amendment to Labour's call for an urgent review of the existing quarantine system that the government will explore alternatives. Now, I welcome that, but again, the question is when? Because, presiding officer, the current quarantine system is simply not fit for purpose. It's a crude attempt at a travel ban relying on deterring people from travelling, but it fails as a public health measure by not picking up whether anyone who enters Scotland has COVID-19. It does not do enough to ensure they then do not spread COVID-19 because it fails to robustly enforce quarantine. The most recent Public Health Scotland statistical report shows that less than 5% of those required to quarantine under the existing rules are actually being properly contacted. A recent UK-wide study highlighted by Professor Linda Bald at the COVID-19 committee suggested that only a quarter of those who were advised to self-isolate were doing so comprehensively. And no wonder the government's approach to quarantine has been half-hearted. The First Minister said at our daily press conference on the 10th of May, we expect confirmation tonight of a period of quarantine for people travelling into the UK. I've made it clear that I believe this is vital to our efforts to contain the virus in the period ahead. And I would encourage the UK government to introduce it as soon as possible. Yet when I asked the Health Secretary in a parliamentary question when the government first began discussions with the UK Home Office on accessing the information they would need to check whether someone entering the country was actually quarantining, the answer eventually came back the 8th of June, a month after the First Minister's comments and after quarantine had already begun. It took a further two weeks until the 24th of June before that process even began. President officer, we need a new approach, one that puts public health with a rigorous testing regime at its heart. In Germany, Italy, France, Greece and more, testing is part of the process for people entering the country. In Iceland, travellers are tested on arrival and tested again on day five of quarantine. It's a system that protects public health by ensuring they know whether someone entering the country has COVID-19. And it supports the economy by lowering the quarantine period. Too often health and support in our economy during COVID-19 are treated as if they are two conflicting priorities. But the reality is our economic recovery relies on keeping the virus under control. Efforts to boost the economy at the expense of public health will be self-defeating. That's why it's important to find measures which support both. If we don't support our economy, if we do not do more to prevent thousands of job losses, the health impact that will have on families will be immeasurable. So why aren't we properly considering airport and follow-up testing as an option in Scotland? Well, Professor Linda Ball gave the game away when she told last week's COVID-19 committee the bigger reason why we do not yet have airport testing is to do with infrastructure. We are compromising public health and putting jobs at risk because of the failure to put in place a robust testing infrastructure. President officer, now is the time for action. Time to work with the aviation sector, trade unions and all stakeholders to urgently agree a support package for Scotland's aviation workers. Time to ensure that package puts protecting jobs, working conditions and support for a just transition to a green economy front and centre. Time to replace a quarantine system that isn't fit for purpose and replace it with one that puts protecting public health with testing at its very centre. Today, we have the opportunity to come together as a parliament to send a united message to Scotland's workers. We are listening to you and we are on your side. Thank you. I have, uh, I have a little time in hand, so at, for the moment, I can let members have their time made up.
if they take interventions, I would like to encourage them. Uh, I now call Michael Matheson to speak to and move Amendment 227711.3. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, President Officer. And, uh, I should say from the very outset, we do not underestimate the international impact of COVID-19 and its impact on the aviation industry. Nor do we underestimate the importance of the sector to our economy and the challenges ahead in helping it to recover. In March, as COVID-19 spread across the world, airlines that provided our global connectivity for business, leisure and tourism experienced a sudden and dramatic collapse in demand. Quite simply, people stopped travelling and people stopped booking travel for future dates. Travel restrictions around the world meant that the number of aircraft operating globally was only about one-third of the total available. The impact of that rippled through the airlines to airports, ground handling companies, airport retail, fuel suppliers and many other companies that make up the aviation sector. That has led to significant job losses with more families facing the threat of redundancy as we approach what will be a very challenging winter for the industry. Over the last few months, the Scottish Government has worked with the aviation sector to provide support where it can. But, Signing Officer, I want to impress upon the Chamber that the single most impactful action to maintain jobs and put the industry in a position where it can support our economic recovery from COVID-19 is for the UK Government to intervene to offer short-term financial relief through the coming winter months. We have repeatedly called on the UK Government to extend the job retention scheme for the industry or deliver a targeted alternative for the sector. And again, I wrote to the Chancellor this week asking her, for him to make this critical intervention. Over the last six months, I will later, but I want to make progress first of all. Over the last six months, we have maintained that dialogue with the Scottish aviation sector and with the STUC to discuss short-term measures we can take within the powers available to us and a long-term support to help the sector return to growth. These discussions have been very constructive and with the powers available to us, specific actions have been delivered or are underway. As part of our £2.3 billion package of business support, we have provided business rates relief in 2020-21. This measure, not replicated in England or Wales, benefits all of Scotland's airports, ground handling companies and Logan Air. Airports have asked us to engage with them on, on opinions around te testing passengers arriving in from overseas and we are already doing so. We recognise the effect that quarantine restrictions have, either in Scotland or elsewhere, on the propensity to travel or on airlines deciding which routes to operate. But we are also clear that we have to mitigate the risk of importing COVID-19 cases. And the current 14-day self-isolation requirement is the most effective way to do that. I'll give way to Mr Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. The Cabinet Secretary not understand that this is not the most effective way to combat COVID-19. The Scottish Government doesn't know if anybody, how many people have come in through our airports with COVID-19. It hasn't a clue. The only way to find out is to test and track those people properly, not to pretend that we're testing, we're, that everybody's coming in under quarantine, so that's okay. COVID is coming into this country Briefly, and you please, don't know Mr. Rumbles, who is Cabinet bringing Secretary. it in. Well, Senator Officer, when it comes to these matters, we do take uh, very clear clinical advice. And I must confess, I'm much more minded to listen to the clinical advice that we receive rather than that directly of Mr. Rumbles. But notwithstanding that, what I can say to him is that we've already engaged with airports on options around testing passengers that could be piloted to better under understand the risk around transmission. Uh, members uh, will, I'm sure, fully recognise that this is not a straightforward subject. But we have agreed to assess the options that airports will submit and that our respective clinical advisors are working together in looking at developing these options. This work is ongoing at the present and ongoing discussions are taking place between the clinical advisors on this matter. In addition to this, I'll give way to uh, Mr Simpson. Graham Simpson. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. Have the airports submitted any options yet? 
My understanding, my understanding is that they have just submitted some data to the clinical advisors in the Scottish Government, which is presently being reviewed. That only took place in the course of the last day or so. Uh, so once we've had an opportunity to consider that, we'll then be in a position where we can have further discussions with the airports to look at these issues. Presenting officer, alongside this, we're also taking forward the route development and recovery work, uh, which has been taken forward at pace. We've successfully been able to help airports improve connectivity in recent years, helping to secure new routes to Chicago, Boston, Washington, Doha, Dubai, and many other European countries. This work is continuing with our renewed focus on helping airports rebuild our connectivity, with specific cases being progressed for summer 2021. This work benefits from a strong and well-established partnership with airports and officials continuing to have regular discussions on emerging challenges and priorities and opportunities. Part of this is to assess the changes air airlines are making to their fleets and aspects of airlines changing their strategies, which in turn have a bearing on the likelihood of some routes returning and resuming in the near future. The objective is to help ensure that the most important routes come back quickly, with a particular focus on our connectivity to global hubs like Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Dubai, on connectivity with the USA and Canada, which are so important for tourism and exports, and our connectivity with the rest of Europe, focusing on key business centres and our inbound tourism market. Now more than ever, it's essential that Scotland remains open and easily accessible to our friends in Europe and our businesses can easily access important European markets. I'm confident this work will deliver positive results. And while we're ambitious, we're also realistic. The impact, I'm sorry, I have to make progress of having given way on a number of occasions. The impact COVID-19 has had on airlines globally means that this work is more challenging than it has ever been, with strong competition from peer countries across Europe in a changed environment with fewer aircraft operating as airlines downsize their fleet. So, an officer, in helping the sector restore connectivity and rebuild, we will do, it do so in a way that also ensures environmental impacts are mitigated, in a way that incentivizes or encourages airlines to use the newest, most efficient aircraft on Scottish routes. This is an important stepping stone on the path towards lower emissions and zero emission aircraft. We want to restore connectivity, but reduce the environmental impact in doing so. We have an opportunity to help the sector showcase what it has done and what it can do in the future. The importance of connectivity between the mainland and the Highlands and Islands has also been mentioned in the motion today. And during the course of the lockdown period, we provided direct support to Logan Air to operate a skeleton service, ensuring that all island airports had at least one flight per day to the mainland for essential travel and medical supplies. And recent months have shown yet again the essential role that Logan Air, Hyal and their staff play in this important part of our transport infrastructure. I'll give way to Mr Stewart now. I yes, appreciate David the Stewart, Cabinet please, Secretary please. giving way. Does the Cabinet Secretary support my campaign and the campaign of the Chambers of Commerce from Caithness to ensure that we have a public service obligation from Wick to Edinburgh and Wick to Aberdeen? Currently, there are no flights from this airport at all. It needs a PSO and it needs the government support to get this up and running. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, member, the member will be aware that we are presently evaluating the business case that's been put forward by the Chamber of Commerce. And I know my good colleague, uh, Gail Ross has been pressing on this issue for a number of months now, and I can assure you that we'll give that fair consideration. Then, officer, I'm conscious of time. But despite the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had across the world on the aviation sector and all of those employed within it, I hope the whole chamber will support our ongoing efforts to help its long-term recovery and support our calls for the UK government to introduce specific measures to help prevent further failures and job losses through the winter months. General Officer, we do not have a window into the future of the aviation sector. We cannot say with any certainty how quickly it will recover, but we will do all that we can do to help rebuild a sustainable industry that supports business, tourism and the economy of a whole, as a whole. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you.
And I call now Graham Simpson to speak to and move amendment 22711.1. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I thank the Labour Party for bringing this important debate to the chamber today? I raised the crisis in our aviation sector with the First Minister last week. She offered warm words, but so far there's been little in the way of action. But Parliament can unite today around the motion, which we will support, and hopefully that will spur the government into doing much more. The crisis has been caused by government action and then inaction. Lockdown was a policy choice with severe knock-on consequences, both immediate and, if we don't act soon, potentially long-term. In Scotland, if we want to connect to the world, we rely on our airports to get us there, but foreign travel has all but stopped. Across the UK, the aviation industry has lost 95% of its flights during lockdown. Passenger numbers at both Aberdeen and Glasgow airports are 80% down on the previous year. Passenger numbers were down as much as 99% during the first months of the pandemic. The reduction in traffic and passengers means Aberdeen and Glasgow airports have lost their main source of revenue, but costs are the same. Passenger numbers at Edinburgh Airport are down 79% on last year. Airlines have cancelled routes, many of which will not return. They're making widespread redundancies and are reducing their fleets. Virgin Atlantic has announced cuts of more than 1,150 jobs. Logan Air plans to cut 68 jobs. There's been a 30% cut in the EasyJet workforce and BA has moved to axe 12,000 roles. Scotland's connectivity its aviation industry and the jobs it supports is at serious risk. During the first four months of the pandemic, UK airports lost just under £2 billion, the equivalent of over £15 million each day, and they're projected to lose at least £4 billion by the end of 2020. A lockdown has cost Edinburgh Airport £3.5 million, and that is despite furlough. This cannot continue. Last week, I warned that Scotland's airports face a job tsunami. Thousands of people are employed in our aviation sector in Scotland, and with little to no trade, they face a bleak future. Now, I said last week that Scotland could end up no longer connected to the world, and that's not being alarmist. Quarantine, even just the threat of quarantine, is putting people off flying. Last week, Figures show that no one is being tested on arrival at our airports and less than 5% of those asked to quarantine gets a follow-up phone call. But 30 other countries are doing what our airports uh, are asking to be allowed to do and that is test all passengers on arrival from outside the UK. So from no one being tested to everyone, we could then follow up with anyone testing negative and do a second test in a few days' time. The plain fact is that we have absolutely no idea, no idea, if anyone who is asked to quarantine is actually doing it. The system is hopeless. So today, I'm calling on the Scottish Government to beef things up and agree to a trial of airport testing. It can be done. In Italy, a negative coronavirus test is obligatory before a flight. Passengers check in uh, an hour early and if they test positive, they're not allowed to board. We should aim at least to cut the quarantine period, as France has just done, from 14 days to seven. If we don't act, we'll lose a sector that we cannot afford to let go of. And the wider Scottish travel industry is fighting for survival. This matters to our economy. Why would we want to turn our backs on 11 billion pounds of economic activity in the wider Scottish supply chain, which tourists bring us. Now, without outbound tourism, we lose inbound tourism. The two are co-dependent. Outbound travel from the UK is worth £1.7 billion, with 25,000 people employed in this sector in Scotland. A survey undertaken in August by the Scottish Passenger Agents Association concluded that 70% of travel agents have experienced a drop in business of over 75%. We're losing many travel uh, brands on a daily basis. They include Flybe, STA Travel, Flight Centres, Shearings, and Cruise and Maritime Voyages. And without urgent interventions, more will join that list. 
The entire travel sector is at risk, so governments, plural, must use all levers at their disposal to help, and that's why the amendment in my name, which I move, says that they should review air passenger duty. Now, some have called for a temporary suspension of the duty, and that may help. Difficult times call for tough decisions, and both our governments should get their heads together on this. Now, I think all parties in this chamber, bar the Greens who haven't even bothered to turn up, get the seriousness of this. Uh, no, but I won't have that. I'm sorry. Mr Harvey is speaking remotely, as many members do. So that's very unfair. Will you please take that back? The Greens are not in the chamber. I, I beg your pardon. Mr Harvey is speaking remotely, as is required in, in here. So I think you should apologise, if not to me, which I certainly would accept, but to Mr Harvey. I'll apologise to Mr Harvey, but we'll not be, we will not be supporting the government amendment. It does not go far enough on airport testing. The Green Amendment shows they do not support the aviation sector. To summarise, we want a trial of airport testing with follow-up testing if you're negative. We want a review of air passenger duty with governments working together, and there should be tailored support for the travel sector. Health is of paramount importance, but our response to one virus should not be at the expense of all else. Scotland needs air travel to connect to the world. Let's make sure that when we're through this crisis, we have a sector left that is able to get us to that wider world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Simpson, though I do think you gave a very grudging apology in what was a very unfortunate remark and made me very angry. Um, I call on Patrick Harvey, please, to speak to and move Amendment 22711.2. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I'm happy to accept uh, any apology for that comment and for your own recognition of the fact that working from home remains a default where we can. I'm happy to take part in the debate those terms. And I'm also grateful to Colin Smith for bringing the debate. The impact of job losses to date has been really significant and devastating for many people. Many more people are living with uncertainty about what lies ahead. Economic change is always disruptive, whatever the cause. We want to minimise the harm that results. We do need to plan properly and we need to use the powerful role of the state to support people and communities instead of simply abandoning them to market forces. The urgent need for a just transition plan for aviation should be clear, and this need existed well before COVID. There's a tragically long track record of talk about transition, but without action. The Greens have made the case for just transition. We made it in relation to open cast coal. We made it in relation to Longana. We made it in relation to Grangemouth, Hunterston, Moss Moran, and in relation to the whole fossil fuel industry. Transition is needed where current economic or industrial patterns are unsustainable and have to change. But it's also important to be clear about what transition means and what we're transitioning to. In the words of the motion, what does sustainable aviation beyond COVID mean? Fundamentally, it has to involve a recognition that before COVID, aviation growth went too far. I would draw members' attention uh, to the Aviation Environment uh, Federation and Transport Scotland briefing, which sets out clearly that transport is the biggest problem for tackling climate change and aviation is the most polluting form of transport. Transport is now Scotland's largest source of climate emissions, one where there has been no progress since 1990. And while the industry, the aviation industry, has set itself a theoretical target of net zero, there is no policy mechanism for holding to account to deliver on this. And there's no rational basis for having confidence that it can be met with pre-COVID uh, pre aviation levels. Put simply, if we want to cut aviation emissions, which we must, then we need fewer flights than the pre-COVID norm. The Scottish Government has had long-standing support for new routes, Regular motions come from uh, government backbenchers celebrating growing flight numbers at airports. Uh, and when the aviation uh, passenger duty, the airport passenger duty commitment was shelved on the grounds of climate change, other policies designed also to achieve aviation growth continued to be Scottish government policy. 
And then came the 2019 election and the Channel 4 climate debate, in which the First Minister made a personal acknowledgement of the need to fly less. This was a first. Now, this clearly didn't mean the collapse in aviation which COVID brought about. Nobody was predicting that back in November last year. But it was a recognition that the pre-COVID level of aviation needed to be reduced. So for unexpected reasons, we find ourselves once again seeing immense harm caused because we had no transition plan already in place for an industry which did need to contract. Such a plan would clearly have struggled to cope with the events of this year, but it would have given us a stronger starting point. Colin Smith is absolutely right that what we've seen in these recent months is very far from a just transition. But nor should we aim to rebuild aviation without such a transition plan. And looking forward, if we don't yet have any policies in place, either to support investment in new sustainable jobs in communities which have relied on aviation, or to limit the regrowth of aviation to a sustainable level below the pre-COVID situation. We don't even have a sense from the Scottish Government about what that safe level should be. And we can't just afford to let this question drift. Jet fuel consumption in Europe crashed to 5% of 2019 levels by April. Now it's back to over 30%. In China, it's returned to over 60%. It is not only reasonable but urgent to ask how far should that go. Latest research suggests that the climate impact of aviation is around three times that of the emissions alone due to radiative forcing. The original Climate Change Act recognised this and called for an appropriate multiplier to be set. But the Scottish Government set that multiplier at one, in other words, parity. On COVID testing at airports, I'm happy to see the quarantine system kept under continual review, and testing may well have a role to play, but this must be focused on the need for control of the virus, and we must aim to achieve the greatest public health benefit. And there are other aviation issues which have also been impacted by COVID, like flight path reviews. A clear plan from government and the industry to manage demand would take the threat of flight path expansion off the table for hundreds of thousands of people living around airports like Edinburgh and others. It would also allow a proper consultation to take place to accommodate any technical changes that are really needed for the flight paths, rather than using modernisation as an excuse to push through increased capacity. In closing, Presiding Officer, none of the other parties in this debate are yet willing to acknowledge the fundamental reality that there must be limits to aviation, and the return to business as usual and pre-COVID aviation levels would be unacceptable. That's why I can't support the motion or the government or Conservative amendments. That's why I now move the amendment in my name. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Harvey. And I now call Alec Cole-Hamilton. Mr Cole-Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to Colin Smith from the Labour Party for bringing forward this debate today. As a representative for what would normally be Scotland's busiest airport, I know the immense toll that this virus has had on the sector. Edinburgh Airport is the gateway for millions visiting our country every year, supporting tourism across this nation. But it has been a shadow of its normal self for months. I thank, it thankfully remained open throughout uh, for critical repatriation, medical and freight flights. I'm immensely grateful to all the hardworking staff for all they did to, to keep that going. However, long-term presiding offer, it's impossible for them to balance the books when 80% of airport costs covering air security to air traffic control can't budge. A third of staff have been made or re redundant already. Two out of the 7,000, 2,000 out of the 7,000 jobs across the campus are gone. That's devastating for them personally and a real blow for my constituency of Edinburgh Western, where so many of them live. There are sectors like aviation that will take much longer to bounce back when we get out of this crisis. So we should be smoothing out the cliff edges in support like furlough, extending it like Germany, France and Austria have already done. Taking it into the middle of next year could avert 1.2 million UK redundancies. But presiding officer, the pandemic sparked job losses, but Edinburgh Airport is clear that Scottish government decisions in response to that crisis have further fueled them. On quarantine, I quote, they say it has exacerbated the number of job losses at their airport. Yeah, yeah. 
The Scottish Government's amendment fails to even acknowledge that there are problems, but the list is very long. No quarantine system until six months into the global pandemic. The Spanish quarantine turned off on a Monday, switched back on on a, by that Saturday. Airbridges come with a degree of uncertainty. We all know that. But as we watch the other rates in other countries, but that was total chaos. The Justice Secretary said 20% of people were being spot checked in June when the actual figure at that time was an absolute zero. Contact tracers haven't been able to find more than 800 people, and that number is rising. And the government hasn't even been measuring how many of those quarantine those in quarantine do become ill. So we don't know which airbridges are working to stop the spread of the virus. Airport, Edinburgh Airport described the current system as a travel ban in all but name. Badly implemented, poorly policed and sapping in confidence. Those are their words, presiding officer. I know that wasn't the intention of ministers. So this mess needs sorting out. A robust system would help the sector find its feet. It would boost consumer confidence and critically, I'm convinced it could achieve so, so much more in terms of the protection of public health and preventing further importation of the virus. In response to questions from Willie Rennie last week, Professor Linda Bold told committee, airport testing is going to be something that we will require. I see airport testing with follow-up testing at home as potentially having twin benefits. Professor Bold argued it could improve quarantine compliance, pointing to one study suggesting that only 25% of people adv advised to self-isolate uh, self were doing that comprehensively. Public health could be better protected if there's that knowledge, either tests or testers would be turning up during quarantine. Compromising safety isn't an option, but quarantine testing could allow for people returning from abroad or visiting to get on with their lives sooner. That possibility is so important to the viability of airports like Edinburgh. So the Scottish Government needs to do the work on this, acquire and share the science, look at what France, Estonia and Germany have all been doing. Professor Linderbold also told us last week that the bigger issue why we don't have airport testing yet is an infrastructure one. Since then, the testing system has plunged deeper into chaos. The test half of the test and protect system is falling down. If the Scottish and UK governments can't get that right, it won't just be aviation recovery that's in big trouble, it's our schools, the NHS, and our care homes too. And presiding officer, in the course of this debate, I am very mindful that the pandemic isn't the only pressing threat facing humanity right now. The climate emergency cannot wait, and aviation needs to play its part. It's why we successfully opposed the SNP's plan to slash air passenger duty. It's why I can't fathom the SNP support for a third runway at Heathrow, bringing 600,000 tonnes of new emissions to Scotland by 2040. Edinburgh, like the rest of Scotland, needs aviation for tourism and our economy, only we need it to be greener too. Grounded flights, people working from home, far fewer tourists buzzing up and down the Royal Mile. It feels huge, but for the climate, it's not. Experts are already telling us that the changes from COVID will barely register as a blip in humanity's con uh, continued contribution to climate change. But the route map to making aviation sustainable isn't to help uh, to let the economic impact of coronavirus do its worst, shredding through livelihoods. It requires systems change, and that's something that governments need to reach for, including in their discussions with airlines and airports. And Edinburgh Airport know this too. They say it's important that the government sets a price for their interventions. So it's possible to get those transition plans, accelerate decommunization, attach green strings, and support jobs. In conclusion, presiding officer, we are still firmly in the clutches of this virus. Lives and livelihoods are at threat. The changes I believe that we've outlined today and are outlined in Colin Smith's excellent motion that we will support decision time can protect both of those jobs. Thousands upon thousands of workers in my constituency are crying out for this parliament to do something and this government to do something to step in to help. Testing, quarantining and more support is part of the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. At open debate, there's a little time in hand for interventions. Polly McNeill, to be followed by George Adam. Ms McNeill. Airports have ground to a halt in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, and the industry is literally collapsing. And some think there may actually be no return if no help is offered. This is the actual reality today. Is the reality is that the unions, some political parties, are really concerned about the short, medium and long-term prospects for our aviation industry. 
the job losses that are expected to be and the scale of the collapse of the mining industry in the 1980s. And I don't think that is an exaggeration. The impact on the wider economy is acute and airline capacity is already shrinking. And it's important to put on the record that some airlines have already scrapped their planes permanently. This must be understood to understand the potential devastation and the prospects of real recovery. So for me, the Scottish Government does not seem to recognise so far the scale of the impending disaster. And Michael Matheson and other ministers seem to be too quiet whilst this unfolds. Three months ago, I did hear the Cabinet Secretary promise that there was a long-term recovery plan. We need to hear more about this, Cabinet Secretary. We need your assurance that, this, that some of the powers that are within your gift are being used and that you recognise the scale of the problem. Unite the Union have warned for months about the depths of the crisis and the horrendous attack on terms and conditions that Colin Smith has talked about. But make no mistake, if this is allowed to happen without conditionality attached to any government funding, this will spread across the country to other sectors if we do not get a grip. As the Labour motion makes clear, we demand a specific package of support for the aviation industry and should include protections for jobs and working conditions. As I've said, it's as much about the wider economy and not just airports, and it must be understood that that's what we're arguing here this afternoon. As heard by other speakers, the policy of self-regulating quarantine and return uh, is not working. And I am counting the number of times, and I have to say that it is anecdotal, I'll say that, of the number of people who are not adhering to quarantine is in double figures in the ones, the cases that I have counted. So I would say to ministers, if it was adhered to, and I felt that people were doing their 14 days quarantine, then perhaps it would be accurate for the government to say it's the most effective way to stop the prevent of the virus. Most ordinary people that you talk to don't think it's the most effective way. And I hope that we're at one with the government on this. We are not arguing to switch a policy um, that we think is a public health risk. We do support the government in approaching a policy that does actually protect public health. But the policy is killing the industry. And here's the important thing. There's potentially another way to achieve exactly the same aims. In Germany, as we've heard, the financial sector had returned to some normality as workers have returned to their offices. And the reason for this is quite simple. It's mass testing. Landing at Frankfurt Airport, Tunnel Force Paul McNamara reported last night that there is no 14-day quarantine in Germany. It's not perfect, but he says it's the best way without locking everything down. I do want to ask government ministers, is it the lack of capacity that's tying you to the current policy? Is that the issue? Or is it that you don't think that this can solve the problem? Airports have called for pilot testing to a pilot and testing uh, to be looked at. Um, and I have to say that I am pleased that I think that Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, has left the door open to that. Yes, I will take it. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. I'm grateful, I'm grateful to Paul McNeill giving way on the matter. The, the issue in terms of airport testing is that the present clinical advice is that the risks of moving to an airport testing regime is greater than it is with the existing quarantine arrangements. That's notwithstanding the points that I respect and understand that the member's making about some of the challenges with the existing quarantine arrangements. But the present clinical advice is that the risk increases in importing the virus if you move to an airport testing regime instead. And that's the piece of analysis that we're undertaking just now in partnership with the clinical advisors from the airports to understand that risk in greater details. And clearly, different countries will decide to deal with risk in different ways. But that's it's all right, Ms. McNeil, you'll, you'll get all that time back. Don't worry. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, not at all. No, the, the Cabinet Secretary doesn't need to apologise for it because it is the heart of the matter. But I have to say in response, why then are 30 countries using a form of testing? Why is Ireland using it? Iceland is using it. Germany is using it. And we are not. And so that's the question I think the government does need to answer on this. Now, we have to take clinical advice seriously. I think people that write to me about quarantine, some people may be adhering to it, and some people can because they, are, they don't want to, because they have jobs where they don't get sick pay. But most people you talk to in the street are saying that if everyone adhered to the quarantine policy, then yes, they would be right. But the pro part of the problem is, so you have to weigh up what is the most effective policy. 
But I believe that the First Minister has left the door open, and I think she's right to do that, because the airports are telling her if she doesn't change the policy and is not satisfied that it still will protect public health, then we will see mass job losses. In Glasgow, the city I represent, the figure is predicted to be about 5,000. I mean, this is a big number. This is a big issue for us in this parliament. Now, I want to say about our transition to a greener system, which Colin Smith has actually uh, begun to address. So, um, we all sign up to the idea that people would take fewer flights uh, and that there would be a just transition, but it needs to be done in a planned way. And it should not be done on the back of an economic crisis where the industry is absolutely spiralling into disasters. I cannot agree with the Greens' approach to this. There is no chance that Glasgow Airport will return to last year's levels. And in fact, the current thinking is that it could not recover for the next five to six years. And in fact, without government support, it will be longer. So I, I think it's unfortunate that the Greens couldn't at least join with us with all the uh, caveats and positions that they'd want to take about just transition because it's about jobs and our economy first and foremost right now. Um, there's only two flights from Glasgow to London. There used to be eight. Now, you might say we don't want to go back to eight, but two is not going to be enough to sustain the business that Glasgow uh, businesses need to take. And, of course, the train for many businesses is not an alternative. And perhaps on another day, Cabinet Secretary, we can discuss the feelings of the rail network on that. So passengers are nervous about travelling, so I think we should uh, recognise that. But those who do, um, it does mean that they don't have confidence in travelling and the current policy. So both the Scottish Government and the UK Government position appears to be uh, that a negative test on arrival doesn't mean that the person doesn't have COVID. And I think that has to be acknowledged. But I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to acknowledge, and Graeme Simpson has twice spoke about this in the Chamber, which I believe is the airport's position, is that many countries have a double test. It's not eradicating no, the policy. You must wind up, policy. sorry, I have given you a minute yeah, and a half. Thank you. So please it's do. reducing the time that the, and making maybe confidence in travelling might come back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I do measure how long an intervention takes, by the way, so I measured how long the Cabinet Secretary took out of your speech. Uh, George Adam, followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, this debate comes to us at a very difficult time for everyone. A time like no other time, and a time of great challenge, a time of unknown futures. And that's part of this debate that I'd like to talk about. But I want to speak in this debate for two very important reasons. The first being that, as everyone knows, Glasgow International Airport is actually in Paisley. And secondly, to highlight the importance of the airport to both Paisley and Renfrew's economy. And the main, this will be the main focus of my speech today, because Glasgow Airport supports in excess of 10,000 jobs. But that's not the only reason why Glasgow Airport is important. Because of our position geographically, it's vital for business and connection to the world with Scotland and also connection with Scotland's many islands. However, aviation is threatened not just by COVID-19, but by the loss, and it's been mentioned today already, President Officer, of consumer trust in aviation. And in all honesty, you can actually understand why people would not want to spend two to three hours packed together in a metal tube uh, with recirculated air uh, when you are actually the, when there's a pandemic or like coronavirus around. And I believe this is the challenge that we face. We have a very important sector of our economy that is currently struggling, but how do we deal with that? And for me, we need to protect what we have. That means ensure we still have our aviation infrastructure if or when we come out the other end of this. And that means protecting the jobs, ensuring that Glasgow Airport can rebuild in the future. And Glasgow Airport has responsibility with their staff and how they deal with their staff through this as well. But the important point for me, in order to help Glasgow Airport, is the continuation of the job retention scheme. Because as we live through these scary times of a worldwide pandemic, there will obviously be challenges for av aviation. The UK government should follow the lead of nations like Germany, who have continued furlough for an extra year. Because if a sector of our economy is affected to the extent that aviation is, then it is only logical that the furlough scheme continues. Because as long as consumer confidence is at the current lows, there is going to be no mad dash to the skies and the beaches of Europe. So if an industry like this going, is going to struggle, then the UK government must continue the job retention scheme. 
I would go as far as saying that the continuation of this scheme is our starting point in this debate. I find it strange, however, that the Labour Party uh, have not said the same. Why have Labour left it out of their motion? Colin Smith mentioned it during his speech, but it's not in the motion. And it's ironic because Len McCloskey, in a letter to the Prime Minister yesterday, said, and I quote, winter and Christmas are fast approaching and the recent rise uh, in infection rate is very concerning, as you, as you recently rule of six uh, underscores. But it also indicates that any normal consumer behaviour and economic activity will not return for some time. It is therefore vital that coronavirus uh, job retention scheme is extended and there is a comprehensive plan drawn for support in each specific sector. So you have to ask yourself, presiding officer, why the Labour Party is not supporting Len McCluskey and Unite call today. The job retention uh, extension is the most important aspect in this debate. We are 45 days away from the UK government pulling away this vital support mechanism to families in Scotland. You could probably Sorry, receive just a minute, Mr Adam. You see in a quiet chamber, little chats like that get very loud. And you're at it again, the two of you. Mr Adams. You could probably receive your redundancy notice over that 45-day period. And for Graham Simpson to acknowledge that there is a potential job tsunami and at the same time not admit that there's actually a, a, a argue for the job retention scheme is an absolute disgrace. And I'll take Mr Smith's intervention. Colin Smith. And, um, uh, if you want me to be accused of not supporting United the Union, then you may want to look at some of the representations they've made to the government, calling on the Scottish Government to take action to support the sector. Labour are very clear. We support a new furlough scheme that has conditionality attached to it to stop jobs being thrown. Now, why does Mr Adams not support conditionality? But before you respond, support? Mr Adams, sorry, Mr Smith, I hope the uh, people listening remotely heard it. Try to speak to your microphone. I know it's polite to look at the member. Mr Adams. Well, one answer I would say to Mr Smith, if you believe in it so much, if you think it's such an important part of this debate and you want to protect these jobs, don't try and talk the Tories into supporting your motion just because you want to beat the government here today. This is about real people, real lives and real jobs. Presiding officer, we're all responsible to ensure that COVID-19 does not spread. And the problem that we have with airports and any increase in traffic could be the actual importation of the virus from elsewhere as well. So we need to be careful. But at the same time as Paisley's MSP, it's difficult for me to say that and still worry about the jobs that are there as well. But that is why I say we must continue. The UK government must continue the job retention scheme because that is what's going to make a difference to that industry and make sure these jobs are still there when and if we come out of this. Presiding officer, we're living in a very difficult time. All of us, regardless of party or parliament, we need to look for solutions. There is no point in any of us making petty points in this debate. We are quite literally dealing with life and death. So today, let's all keep the heat and ensure we're all part of the solution and not engaging in some pointless academic debate. And please, I would ask members to always remember the people that we are discussing here are the people whose jobs are at stake. They are far more important than any of us in this chamber. Thank you very much. And I now call Morris Golden to be followed by Neil Bibby. Mr Golden, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, there aren't many sectors that have been as deeply affected by this pandemic as the aviation industry. The significant decrease in air passenger numbers is having a severe impact. In the UK, the aviation industry is facing a potential loss of over £20 billion this year. It is a worrying time for those employed directly by airlines and airports and for those whose livelihoods relies on a functioning aviation sector. Clearly, the size and the scale of the UK government's interventions have saved tens of thousands of jobs. Hundreds of millions of pounds has been paid to the industry through the job retention scheme. British Airways alone furloughed 22,000 employees, over half its entire workforce. A further 1.8 billion has been accessed from British Airways, EasyJet, Wizz Air, 
and Ryanair through the COVID-19 corporate financing facility. Unfortunately, despite the unprecedented size of the UK government's intervention, we have seen wide-scale redundancies, with tens of thousands of jobs either lost or at risk across some of the biggest operators in the aviation sector. Every week, we are hearing of more redundancies or more jobs at risk, the scale of which is staggering. Last week, it was another 1,150 job losses at Virgin Atlantic and 68 jobs at Logan Air, an airline that is a lifeline to Scotland's remote and island communities. Unfortunately, with the industry on its knees, the magnitude of job losses will not come as a shock to anyone. The impact on the industry has already filtered through to its supply chain. In my own region, this is brought home with the news that 700 jobs were going to be lost at Rolls-Royce Civil Aerospace Facility in Shinnan, brought about by a drop in orders as a result of the pandemic. This will have a devastating impact on the people and the communities affected by these redundancies. Deputy President Officer, more and more job losses will be likely within the aviation sector over the weeks and months ahead. We need action and we need it now. I urge the Scottish Government to work closely with the UK Government as it develops and implements its aviation recovery plan and for the Scottish Government to consider all available interventions at its disposal in order to support the sector and its employees at this time. Kenneth Gibson. Do you believe that the UK Government should support the higher the fire and rehire bill that's being brought forward by Gavin Newland's MP, as a number of Conservative MPs uh, have um, said they would support it. Should the Conservative Morris government Golden. do so also? Uh, I'll be coming on to that, but the general practice of, 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 of firing employees and trying to rehire them on uh, reduced terms and con conditions is clearly not what I would support, and I don't believe that responsible companies would go down that particular route. The Scottish Government should look again at coronavirus testing, as been mentioned by my colleague Graham Simpson at Scottish airports. Industry leaders have made it clear that such a move could be vital to the survival of the industry and will ultimately protect jobs. And the Scottish Government should undertake a review of air passenger duty and explore the impact that a reduction in current rates would have on airlines during these desperate times. Furthermore, the aviation industry workforce is highly skilled and highly trained, and it is vital that this workforce is not dismantled before the industry has had a chance to recover. I call upon the Scottish Government to further explore how it can support skills retention in the industry, and if this is not possible, then how it can support individuals to find new employment. Happy to Cabinet Secretary. It, the member raises an important point here around the issue of skills retention within the sector and a critical element of skills retention in it is the certification process that airside staff can uh, hold a certificate for extended periods of time. Um, uh, does the member agree with me that given that this is largely a reserved area, it is a completely reserved area, the UK government should take proactive action to look at relaxing the existing timescales for the way in which certificates are applied for, for airside operatives, in order to look at how they could flex those to help to support people in the sector and in getting back into the sector when opportunities arise. An issue we've raised with the UK Government, but to date they haven't addressed. Maurice Golden. I think I've been quite clear that I agree that both uh, the UK Government and Scottish Government have a role in retaining those staff, at looking at the specific issue which the member raises regarding certification and ensuring that those skills, if they can't be uh, kept within the uh, industry, then are looked to be redeployed for the benefit of the wider Scottish economy. Because retaining staff and retaining skills will be critical to the industry as we look forward to recovery. And although airlines need to be acting with a commercial focus at this time, I would urge all operators not to use this pandemic as an opportunity to unfairly rewrite staff terms and conditions and impose unjust restructuring. Deputy President Officer, it's clear that this is a difficult time for the aviation 
sector and there will be more challenging times ahead. But this industry is far too important to Scotland to allow it to be decimated. In my own region, the importance of Glasgow Airport on the local community is massive, employing thousands of individuals and contributing over a billion to the Scottish economy. The same can be said of Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Inverness, Dundee and Prestwick. So I would call on the Scottish and UK governments to do all they can to support the industry at this time. The baggage handlers, the cabin crews, the airport logistical staff and the tens of thousands of other individuals employed directly and indirectly by the sector. These are, desperate, uh, 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 these are desperate times and they need all the help they can get. Thank you very much. And I now call Neil Bibby to follow by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. I very much welcome this debate brought forward by Scottish Labour on the aviation sector, which I know will be of interest to many workers in my region. And I support the motion in Colin Smith's name. We do need an urgent plan, strategy, and package of support from the Scottish Government to save aviation jobs. That should include sector-specific support with conditionality on jobs. It should be agreed in conjunction with the trade unions, GMB and Unite, as well as Scotland's airports. And it's also vital we have a robust regime of testing air passengers. It's clear from the debate so far that most people understand the need for sustainable travel options. And most people also recognise, however, that air travel is still a necessity for many of us. Air travel has opened up Scotland to the world, as well as opening up the world to Scots. It's a hugely valuable part of our economy. And like others, I can't emphasise how important it is to my own area. In the west of Scotland region, Glasgow Airport is a key driver of growth, and it is simply the backbone of the Renfrewshire economy. In 2018, it was estimated that Glasgow Airport contributed 1.4 billion to the Scottish economy. It supports over 30,000 jobs throughout Scotland, many thousands of these jobs available to my constituents, jobs which cannot be easily replaced. In 2017, the airport handled more than £3.5 billion pounds of goods. As the managing director, uh, Mark Johnston, said, when Glasgow Airport succeeds, Scotland shares the benefit. Yet far from succeeding, in the face of this pandemic, our airports, our aviation industry and our world-leading aerospace sector are in crisis. In Renfrewshire in the West, we know only too well the costs of deindustrialisation. We're still living with the scars of industrial decline from the 1980s, which was symbolised in Renfrewshire by the closure of the car plant in Linwood. And I'm sorry to say today we risk this happening all over again with the decline of 2020's key sectors of the Renfrewshire economy, aerospace and aviation. Unemployment in Scotland is rising at twice the rate of the UK as a whole. According to the labour, latest labour market statistics, the claimant count in Renfrewshire has nearly trebled. As we've heard from Colin Smith, the Fraser Vallander Institute are forecasting the loss of up to 5,000 jobs in civil aviation and aerospace, pivotal sectors for my community. Yesterday, we read that the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland has signed a lease on premises in Renfrew to develop an £11.8 million project with Boeing, looking into manufacturing processes and technology related to metallic components. That project depends on there being a future for aviation and aerospace in Scotland. Rolls-Royce, with its state-of-the-art facility in Shinnan, is the jewel in the crown of Scottish aerospace. They, too, depend on a healthy world economy where aviation is thriving. And in the era of environmental awareness, Rolls-Royce is a key player in designing and developing aero engines, which are, now, which are more efficient and less environmentally damaging. Without healthy aviation and aerospace industries, my west of Scotland region will be devastated. 700 workers at Rolls-Royce are already losing their jobs. Many have been made redundant in the past few weeks. And the measures announced by the government to protect jobs in these sectors clearly have not worked. Not one of those jobs at Rolls-Royce and in Shin has been saved. Thousands of Scots in these sectors have already lost their jobs, with thousands more set to lose theirs with the premature ending of the furlough scheme. This is an unprecedented crisis, and it requires an equally unprecedented government response. It is right to recognise that certain sectors need special help. Surely aviation and aerospace are industries that also justify special help. How can our economy recover and prosper if Glasgow Airport cannot survive? How can we provide the manufacturing jobs of tomorrow without Rolls-Royce jobs? If we are to preserve 
a successful future for ordinary Scots, we need action like we have never seen before. Not simply extending the job retention scheme, important though that is, but building these industries back. Not appeasing companies that fire and rehire, or companies that turn their back on us like Rolls-Royce, but pushing back against offshoring and redundancies with a plan for urgent action. This crisis demands that the Scottish Government uses its full range of powers and every penny it has to work in partnership with local councils, companies and organisations which have a stake in aviation and aerospace. We need imagination and a will to succeed. We need economic leadership that, if we are honest, has been lacking for a decade. We need to be big enough to set aside differences and work for the common good. This is a crisis that demands a Scottish response, yes, but it also requires a concerted, joined-up UK approach too, particularly in the perilous Brexit world in which we live. This is not an either-or, we need both. The Scottish Government, UK Government and other devolved administrations should come up with an emergency programme for aviation and aerospace jobs. If our aviation and aerospace industries collapse, we will be at permanent disadvantage in the world economy. That is why my Labour colleagues and I are calling on the Scottish Government to promise today that it will use its powers and resources. It will work with trade unions, the airports, other devolved administrations and the UK Government to develop a plan of action equal to the scale of the challenge that confronts us and that starts with the objectives in Colin Smith's motion. We need a plan and strategy because despite the warm words from the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and the motion today, there is no meaningful plan to save airport jobs of my constituents. There is no plan or strategy to replace the airport jobs of my constituents. This needs to be changed urgently. The thousands of my well, constituents sorry, and their families conclude. whose jobs rely on aviation and aerospace will not forgive us if we allow our political differences to hinder an effective fight back for jobs. Thank if you the very Scottish much. Government do that, they will have our support. Thank you very much. I call Kenneth Gibson, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Mr. Presiding Officer, and Mr Bibby talked of manufacturing job losses in the 1980s. He will no doubt therefore wish to condemn the record of Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair, who from 1997 to 2007 presided over the loss of 37 per cent of all Scotland's manufacturing employment, including 55 per cent in Ayrshire. And while I appreciate that Labour MSPs are using a debating slot to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the aviation industry, I grow weary of their continued failure to recognise that neither aviation nor employment law are devolved. They ask for the Scottish Government to support the aviation sector, knowing fine, fine well that fiscal constraints mean the Scottish Government cannot replicate a furlough scheme in Scotland, a constitutional situation Labour wishes to continue. I'll let you in, in soon. Our focus has to be on urging the UK Government to step up and support the aviation sector through uh, this uh, appalling situation we're in at the moment, and it would be better if Labour joined our calls to turn all powers and responsibilities back to Scotland, so we no longer have to urge the UK government to do anything, given so much often falls upon willfully deaf Tory ears. On 17th of March, the Tory Chancellor promised to put together a tailored support package for the aviation industry. It took him exactly one week to tell the aviation industry they should just make do with what they had. And the report commissioned by Unite, the phrase of Alec Fraser Valander Institute estimated 2,330 direct and indirect job losses in civil aviation with an overall economic loss of around 140 million to Scotland. The Scottish Government recognises the enormous impact on the industry and on supply chains and is doing all it can with its limited powers, providing business rates relief for aviation, airports and ground handling providers, something not available in England under the Tories or Labour run Wales. The Scottish Government's partnership for, for Partnership Action for Continuing Employment has also sprung into action, working with many who have sadly lost their jobs due to the crisis. As an Ayrshire M MSP, I am very much aware that aviation and aerospace consists of much more than airports. There is manufacturing, research and development and so on. The supply chain reaches far and wide. Our airports provide jobs for thousands, from high-tech engineering to retail, baggage handling and security people with a huge range of skills, aptitudes and interests. The Scottish Government has long since recognised the specific needs of these industries and their potential for Scotland and Ayrshire's economy. When Presswick Airport was struggling in 2013, the Scottish Government stepped in to purchase it for a pound, saving 300 direct and 1,400 indirect jobs. I'm delighted that Presswick made a £3 million profit last year, having increased its revenue by 46% year-on-year to £36 million. It is therefore disappointing 
that Councillor Tom Marshall, Tory leader on North Ayrshire Council, called for Prestwick Airport to be closed and all its flights moved to Glasgow, regardless of the impact on Ayrshire's economy. Prestwick Airport is well placed to become a spaceport due to its existing facilities, infrastructure, meteorological conditions and transport linkages, creating potential spin-off opportunities for local employment and tourism across Ayrshire. The International Air Transport Association predict that passenger air travel will not return to pre-pandemic levels until 2024, a year later than initially thought. However, there is a focus and enormous potential regarding international freight and aviation services. At the beginning of the pandemic, before we had a chance to manufacture personal protective equipment here in Scotland, Prestwick Airport was instrumental in taking receipt of PPE. Who doesn't remember footage of the first flight arriving from China carrying supplies, including intensive care unit equipment and testing kits? During lockdown, the Scottish Government established the Aerospace Response Group to help preserve the industry and jobs through the pandemic, formulate a response to COVID-19 and explore opportunities. The Economy Secretary Fiona Hislop and her counterparts in Wales and Northern Ireland have called upon the UK Government to establish an aerospace task force to help preserve the engineering and other skills of which there is a wealth in the supply chain. Many of these skills can also benefit other industries. Chairing the group, the Minister for Fair Business, Work and Skills lays as closely with union representatives as he does on a host of other matters. This is vital as British Airways and others have chosen to use the coronavirus pandemic to fire employees and seeks to hire some of them on contracts with inferior terms and conditions, including pay cuts of up to 43%. BA has fired around 12,000 of the 42,000 staff it had at the start of the pandemic and renegotiated, as it says, contracts. Only this morning of evidence before the House of Commons Transport Committee, BA Chief Executive Alex Cruz insisted it was absolutely appropriate to use fire and rehire threats against his own staff. He also said BA had reached an agreement in principle with unions that would result in amendments to existing contracts rather than firing and rehiring. But I was in the Education Committee all morning. I have not had a chance to see how meaningful an exchange this actually was. SNP MS, uh, MP Gavin Newlands, um, Employment Dismissal and Reemployment Bill, also known as a Fire and Rehire Bill, seeks to ban this behaviour aimed at commercially exploiting the pandemic. If the bill is passed, it will amend the Employment Rights Act 1996 to, and I quote, prohibit employers dismissing employees and subsequently reemploying them for the purpose of diminishing the terms and conditions of employment and for connected purposes. By, add, by adding firing and rehiring practices to a list of actions that constitute unfair dismissal, workers across Scotland and the UK can be protected from having to choose between the two evils of losing salary and losing their job. The bill has achieved cross-party support and the backing of key unions and it will provide many more workers than those just in the aviation industry. I would like to see if the UK Tory government backs it. However, the perceived ruthlessness of BA and other airlines reinforces the message that aviation continues to be hit exceptionally hard by the pandemic and merits a tailored support package. Presiding officer, Scottish ministers are doing their utmost, but aviation and employment remain reserved to Westminster. We must unite as a parliament to demand that UK ministers deliver a support package tailored to aviation and aerospace to preserve employment and skills in both these sectors and the supply chain. Michelle Valentine, followed by Tom Arthur. I'm on. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. No one doubts the importance of aviation as an industry, and I think it is a welcome debate that we're having today, given the number of, um, certainly, inbox emails I've received from very, very worried employees. Um, and because of our geographic position as an island, we cannot just dismiss it. We need aviation. We need to cross the seas, and we need to cross them fast in many cases. John Holland Kay, Chief Executive of Heathrow Airport, was right to note that the impact of the aviation industry is not just on visible issues such as tourism, but also the necessity of long-haul flights to the manufacturing industry, with many businesses relying on these flights for their just-in-time supply chains. And as he notes, unless we get these flights moving again, we will not be able to get the economy rebooted. He is, in my opinion, quite right. Not only do 80% of inbound visitors reach the UK by air, air freight accounts for 40% of trade by value. It is essential for our economy that UK air aviation industry gets back on its feet, and the best way to achieve that is for planes to cross our skies again. Not only does this protect cabin crews, it will help retain airport staff, as well as those in industries independent, dependent on air travel. Airports need customers, otherwise they are left paying expensive overheads with little or no income. By June of this year, Heathrow Airport reported it was losing £200 million per month. 
and Edinburgh Airport have advised that 80 per cent of their costs are fixed overheads, costs that accrue no matter how many flights take to the air. And I have no doubt that the government benches must also be concerned about the fixed costs of running airports with no passengers, given Scottish ministers own and operate 11 airports, none of whom are currently even paying business rates. This makes increasing traffic in airports not simply desirable, but a necessity. Indeed, this is something that Gordon Dewar, the Chief Executive of Edinburgh Airport, has highlighted succinctly in a recent open letter to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Mr Dewar noted that a dual approach with balanced attention to health and prosperity is the only way forward, citing the need for a robust testing regime and calling for the Scottish Government's quarantine policy, a travel ban in all but name. As he says, this is simply not a sustainable approach, and I believe he's quite correct. Airports and airlines need customers, and commerce is the best remedy we have available. But this does need an effective testing regime if we're going to tackle COVID continuously. Quarantine doesn't work, and it doesn't work because for most people, 14 days in a place requires 14 days supply of food. And as several people have now informed me, the places which they've gone to quarantine have informed them they're not supplying meals and they'll have to go out and get them. I leave you to uh, consider what that means for people. Both for the sustainability of the sector and for the sake of taxpayer going forward, simply bailing out aviation companies does not pretend a long-term solution. And we've seen this with firms like Flybe. Propping up ailing businesses isn't the way forward and sometimes market forces should be allowed to take their course. However, of course financial support is necessary at present. And measures such as the Scottish Government's move to waive business rates for airports are very welcome. And COVID, as the COVID-19 pandemic develops, it does look very much like the possibility of returning to a state of normalcy by spring next year for aviation is highly unlikely. So accordingly, I would ask the Scottish Government to conduct a study into the feasibility of waiving business rates for airports for another six months, if necessary. And as with countless sectors across Britain, the UK Government's job retention scheme has sought to prevent protect jobs within aviation and other helpful measures including waiving air traffic control charges for 14 months, VAT de deferrals, the COVID-19 corporate financing facility, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme and the introduction of a payment plan facility for the CAA to cover the payment of annual charges. These schemes have been generous and as some have said people like Ryanair and EasyJet have accessed £600 million each while BA and Wizz Air received £300 million apiece. Sadly, though, this doesn't appear to be enough. And I would suggest both governments look at holistic measures such as offering tailored financial support to tourism and travel businesses that are reliant on air travel for their customers. This trade is worth £11 billion to Scotland's economy. Yes? Mm -hmm. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful for giving way. On the one hand, she's saying she doesn't agree with bailouts, and then she's just given us a long list of bailouts. So which is it? Either the air, uh, aviation industry is in trouble and needs assistance, or it doesn't, surely? Michelle Ballantyne. I don't agree with bailouts where there is no future for the company. However, as I acknowledged just then, I said, of course, at the moment, assistance is required, and I've listed some of the assistance that's being given. But I think what you need to look at and what I want to go on and say is that we do need the arrival of visitors and we do need the safeguards and effective testing is the most effective way to make that happen. Trade is what we need in the aviation industry as with all areas of our economy. And we do have to be careful with large scale bailouts and financial support. And I've heard the calls today for in continuing the job retention scheme. And I would say that while the UK's shoulders are broad, they're not broad enough to continue paying everybody's wages forever. And we need to understand what aviation is going to look like post-COVID. And we need to have a tailored plan that ensures that the money we're putting in is about sustaining the interest I industry going forward, not just delaying an inevitable. Uh, Ms. Yeah. Ballantyne's just closing. No, I'm offended. <laughs> OK, so I would say in, in closing then that uh, we do need a balanced approach that takes safety and sustainability into account whilst also addressing the fundamental economic realities. The months ahead 
do, do not present a, a menu of easy choices, but it is important that we stimulate the aviation sector through the ebb and flow of business. That is the lifeblood of the industry, and that is where we must focus. Thank you. And I just say, I'm very keen that we don't have to extend decision time, and we're heading for 10 past five. Yeah. So uh, could everyone take note of that and be quite succinct, please? Uh, Tom Arthur, followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, and I'm grateful to uh, the Labour Party for bringing this important debate to the chamber today. Um, the constituency I represent of uh, Renfrewshire South takes in a, a large portion of uh, West and Southern Renfrewshire, um, as well as the Leven Valley of East Renfrewshire. But where I live in Johnston, the airport's a big presence, not just in terms of employment, but with the sound of aircraft regularly roaring over my head. The wheels don't quite clip, the undercarriage doesn't quite clip the chimney of my house, but it's not far off it. And I think one of the most disconcerting and surreal experiences I had during lockdown was the um, all-pervasive silence across Johnston and then when driving through here to Parliament seeing the lines and rows of aircraft on the runway because every day those aircraft were on the runway was an increasing risk and threat to jobs at the airport in aerospace and wider aviation. Um, so I want to sort of re want to recognise from the outset uh, the highly skilled workforce at Glasgow Airport in wider aviation and in aerospace deserves our full support and it deserves both of our governments working together. I certainly appreciate there is um, a great deal of uh, distrust and mutual antagonism between the UK and the Scottish Government at the moment for understandable reasons, but this is too important an issue to be lost in that particular debate. And I do want to recognise the work that the Scottish Government has already uh, uh, undertaken, uh, particularly the uh, provision of business relates for aviation. Um, with airports and ground handling providers benefiting. And I would note that this, some, this is something that has not been offered elsewhere uh, uh, in the UK or not by the UK government itself, um, who have chosen not to extend that. So that's a resource that has come out of our own money here in this parliament. Um, I want to recognise in particular the impact on the aerospace industry in Renfrewshire um, as a consequence, understandably, of the uh, reduced demand across the supply chain and the particular impact at the Rolls-Royce site at Shinnan. 700 jobs, half the workforce are going and by any measure this is a huge blow to the local economy. Um, and I do welcome, and in this, these difficult circumstances, the work undertaken uh, uh, by the Scottish Government to support staff through PACE um, and also in particular the um, involvement of the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills, Jamie Hepburn. In particular, I, I welcome the establishment of the Aerospace Response Group and I see Mr Hepburn there now understand he'll be summing up for the government this afternoon. I would ask him if he's able to, um, any summing up, or if not, if he could write to me for an update on the work of the Aerospace Response Group. I note that they have a, a wide range of stakeholders involved, and I very much welcome the involvement of the unions, noting the STUC, Unite, Prospect and GMB attending the last, minute for which, last meeting for which minutes are available. I also particularly welcome the attendance of Renfrewshire Council and including representation from Rolls-Royce as well. Um, and I would note that one of the kind of key um, areas of interest of the group is in people and skills, particularly around apprenticeships and job loss mitigation, which were identified as immediate priorities. Um, and I also recognise that the, the subgroup, um, we're looking to establish a subgroup to have further discussions on aircraft decommissioning and saw this as a good opportunity to maintain skills and capacity. And I would just note from the minutes that on the issue of aircraft um, uh, decommissioning, it was highlighted that this is not about creating a, a scrap yard for planes, but remanufacturing and reusing components. Um, and there was optimistically further potential, it states, to create a global centre of expertise. And that work uh, was now required to develop a full business case to progress this opportunity at pace. And I think all members of the chamber would want to see that work undertaking expeditiously. So while these people are still there and we can retain that talent and that skills base, which will be vital for our economy going forward. And particularly if we want to effect a truly just transition um, to net zero um, for the aviation sector. Now, I also want to uh, pay tribute to my work of my colleague, Gavin Newlands MP. He's a constituency neighbour. We take in part of uh, the northern part of my constituency um, in Linwood and Craig Ends and Brookfield. And he has been a, a tireless champion for the aerospace sector and Glasgow Airport. Um, his engagement with uh, aviation and aerospace industries um, has been very welcome. And he's obviously pushed for targeted support in this sector within the House of Commons. 
And I also want to just you know, uh, thank him and, and to make sure he is credited in the chamber, as others have, for his uh, private member's bill that he's introduced to end the exploitative and um, disgraceful policy of uh, fire and rehire. And I appreciate, I very much welcome that uh, Mr. Starmer is now supporting that. I would just note that that was announced on Monday. Um, the me private member's bill was introduced by Gavin on the 22nd of July, and it was presented to Parliament on the 9th of June, three months ago. So I just do think it's very important. It's, it's not about whose name's on it at the end, but I think it's important to recognise the work uh, of a hard-working constituency MP to address this issue and represent his constituents. I also want to um, recognise and welcome, and it would be remiss of me not to, yesterday's announcement of the partnership between Strathclyde University and Boeing, uh, which will be the latest venture set up with the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District a few miles north from my constituency. And this is a, a partnership that's forecast to create potentially as many as 200 high-skilled, high-value jobs at the cutting edge of design and technology. And this is made possible in part through 3.5 million of Scottish Enterprise funding. And this is the, exactly the kind of intervention we need. And so it's very welcome to see the Scottish Government um, engaging with that. There's much more I'd want to say, but the, the, the final point I, I, would want to, uh, and I would want to end on is, is the need for the UK Government to provide targeted support for the aviation sector. And this, this is not a cop-out. We, we simply don't have the borrowing powers under the fiscal framework to affect a, 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 a necess the necessary quantum that's required to give that support. So the UK Government needs to do that. This is impacting aviation right across the UK. Aviation is a reserve matter. And so the UK Government really needs to give that targeted support. And most importantly, they must extend the furlough scheme. Thank you. Please keep to below six minutes. Sarah Boyack, followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very glad our Labour motion has been able to get a real debate going today, focusing on what the sustainable future of the aviation industry looks like and how we deliver it. I want to thank Unite for their campaign of work, alerting us to the crisis in the industry, and in my own area for Edinburgh Airport for their briefing today and for the work they have put in to make us aware of the solutions that they think are needed that we can debate this afternoon. As colleagues have said, there are currently hundreds of jobs at risk. Many of these jobs are at companies which operate at multiple airports, showing just how interconnected the businesses are which make up the industry are. But it's not just those jobs. It's tourism jobs, it's hospitality jobs, it's the wider regional economy. And the government's amendment to Labour's motion today highlights rates relief given to the aviation sector. But while this has been welcome, I want to quote Benny Higgins, because he, he stated that while it's been an effective mechanism for immediate, broadly based support to businesses, it is a blunt instrument, and over the coming months, it will be necessary to deploy more targeted, continuing support in specific areas and to specific sectors as part of the recovery plans. So our motion today focus on is what can be done by the Scottish Government now. And there is a reference to the job retention scheme at the UK level, just to mention the, the points that have been made by a couple of SNP backbenchers. But we need more. And this debate has to generate change. The response to the challenges faced by the aviation sector need to be forward-looking. And that's why it's about sustainable aviation. It's got to look beyond COVID-19. With the industry at risk of collapse and the service reduced by an estimated 98 to 99 per cent, according to the Airport Operators Association, now is the time to deliver changes to keep the industry going, but to transform it for the future. It's got a skilled workforce. It's good quality jobs for people across Scotland. It connects our communities, in particular our island communities, and those benefits have got to be protected. But any recovery plan has got to be tied to maintaining and improving workforce paying conditions and meeting environmental targets. And the Scottish Government needs to use its powers and learn from other countries across the world to leverage change from business and to support that change. Surely saving and transforming the avi aviation industry for better means ensuring that dividends aren't paid to shareholders until the company is financially viable. Ensuring that any company in receipt of Scottish Government support is tax domiciled in the UK. Using UK suppliers, using the most ecologically friendly technologies and fuels are used and looking at local investment and development. Now, I know the Scottish Government agrees with the sentiment that was clear in the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks, but we've got to see action. 
We need boldness from the Scottish Government. We need leadership, not just headline announcements. And our transport sectors more widely need the support to make the transition we need. So I want to comment on the Transform Scotland comments. They are right to say that we need to look at environmental impact across the transport sector. So that means investment in green, low carbon buses, not seeing contracts cancelled at a time when we need to reduce damaging emissions, not just low carbon trains, but affordable trains so that people are able to choose the train rather than driving or flying because of the cost for certain journeys. So with any government expenditure or tax reductions, we need to see multiple benefits right across our economy. And finally, I really want to comment on the issue of testing. Surely it is fundamental to the recovery of our economy and our people going forward. What is the point of quarantining without testing? How can anyone plan ahead given the average change on uh, advice on travelling is uh, every 3.6 days? And I listened very carefully after Polly McNeill's passionate speech to the response by the Cabinet Secretary in his intervention. He did not address the fundamental issue in our motion. It calls for an urgent review of the existing quarantine system and for the Scottish Government to bring forward options for a robust regime of airport testing on arrival with follow-up testing at home that places protecting public health at the centre, including supporting evidence and mechanisms for any proposal to safely reduce the quarantine period. It's not telling the minister exactly what to do, it's saying what needs to be delivered. And the point is that the UK and Scottish governments need to be ahead of the game, not way behind it, not behind the rest of Europe, Iceland, Germany, Greece, France, Italy, as others have mentioned. We need action now. We need to look at the scientific advice, but how can a system that has got all of our constituents who've been through the airports and who are worried, who know that the quarantine system isn't working, we just cannot dismiss them. We've got to align the points about the impact of testing, the need for a reliable testing system. It cannot be right that the only testing in our airports is people who are sent to our airports to drive in, get tested and then go back home again but not if you're actually going through the airport for travel. That cannot be right. We need to get this fixed. It needs to happen now. We need a sustainable aviation industry with decent jobs, a transition to low-carbon infrastructure, and we need confidence in the industry to enable that change to take place and to keep it going through what has been an unthinkable experience in terms of our economy, but it will get worse if we don't get those jobs protected. There is a tsunami of job loss coming soon. If we don't get the job retention scheme in place and we don't get the targeted investment from the Scottish Government that is at their hand, that they can do now. So I hope today's debate isn't just a series of speeches around the Chamber, but that it will lead to urgent action from both the Scottish Government and the UK Government, and that this debate will have meant something, because our constituents all those who work in the industry need change and they need it now. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, we have to come in under the allotted time or decision time will be late. Willie Coffey, followed by Alexander Burnett. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. A good place to start in the debate in aviation is surely to begin with some good news, to welcome the news that Presswick Airport, saved by this government in 2013, saved 300 direct jobs and 1,400 indirect jobs. It's back in profit last year with a £3 million operating profit, a point made earlier by my colleague Kenny Gibson, but nevertheless worth repeating. Swift action taken by our government secured its future and gave it a fighting chance to recover and prosper. Presswick Airport is crucial for the aerospace sector and is crucial for the Ayrshire economy as a whole, as we hope to capitalise on the growth deal and hopefully Spaceport too, if that comes our way. It's, it's a strategic asset for us in Ayrshire and the Scottish Government is rightly doing all it can to nurture it and secure its future. Now, of course, we're facing a different battle, and it's a battle we need to try our best to stick together locally and internationally to help the aviation sector get through this crisis. The impacts on the sector is wide and varied, and it affects us particularly in Ayrshire. Global aircraft manufacturers' decisions have an impact on the supply chain from Boeing and Seattle, to the wing makers in Ayrshire. At the end of July, Boeing had reduced its deliveries of aircraft from 240 in the first half of last year to only 70 this year, 
and only 20 from April to June. Airbus is similar with orders being delayed. These two giants have supply lines stretching across the Atlantic into the Scottish aerospace sector and the leading edges for wings for Boeing and Airbus are made in Ayrshire and jobs have already been lost. We've seen around 270 lost at GE Caledonian and about 180 at Spirit. Rolls-Royce and Wyman Gordon have shed nearly 800 jobs. And the consequent impact on our economy is substantial, with an impact of anything between 90 and £140 million pounds when you consider the knock-on effects. I note, President Officer, some aspect of, aspects of Airlines UK's recent letter to the Prime Minister to intervene chimes with some of our own views about what needs to be done, for example, on job retention. They are also asking for things like APD waivers, regional air corridors and COVID testing trials with five-day quarantine arrangements, which I can leave to the Minister perhaps to offer a view later on. I am not sure if these asks will work, but the industry does not expect a recovery to pre-2019 levels for at least four years. And as a result, are consulting on around 30,000 job losses, with many more in the supply chain affected too. They claim that other jurisdictions have put in place support packages for their industries some time ago, which I hope to mention before I close. Last week, President Officer, I also met online with colleagues from East Ayrshire Council, from the SNP, Labour and Tory groups. All were united in their calls to help, to ask for help from wherever it may come. And they too are particularly keen to protect Prestwick at this vital time in its recovery. The three Ayrshire councils are working together to try and put together some schemes locally that might help sustain jobs and provide some opportunities to help them get through this period. So it's really encouraging that the Aerospace Response Group has been set up by our Minister Jamie Hepburn. There's good representation from the council's sector lead officers and I think it's met two or three times already. We literally have high hopes that we can't do all this alone. No doubt the action plan they will come up with will ask both governments to use whatever leverage they have to sustain the industry until it's certain that the virus is no longer a threat to public health. It's time, I think, for creative minds and creative thinking to come together or the consequences will be dire. Other jurisdictions, as I mentioned, are doing what they can by extending their furlough arrangements or providing cash and loans in some form or another to the sector to tide it over. America announced $50 billion in bailouts for airlines and $10 billion for airports. Italy has spent $650 million buying Alitalia to basically save the company. The Dutch government is spending 3.4 billion euros in loans and Lufthansa is getting 9 billion euros. Air France, 7 billion, and the list can go on. Presiding officer, and just winding up my contribution, I don't envy the task of our government ministers in all the governments who are trying to navigate their way through this. Being open-minded to try new ideas and new solutions is probably a good place to start. Listening to the industry and the workers who make the avi aviation industries a success is more important than it ever has been. And I sincerely hope that we can find a way that allows these industries to survive and flourish safely in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander Burnett, followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to thank Labour for bringing forward this debate today uh, as the impact of coronavirus on our aviation industry is one that rightly deserves attention. As my colleagues and other members across the chamber have already noted, uh, communities across the country are dependent on this sector to remain reliable for both personal and business reasons. And as such, we have a duty to protect it in Scotland. And with jobs at risk at airports across Scotland, it is not just the aviation workforce who could face redundancy if the industry does not receive adequate support throughout this crisis. There are several other industries as well, such as fuel suppliers, construction companies, manufacturers, and businesses who sell goods in airports, and the list goes on, who will be affected. And furthermore, our tourism industry is also heavily reliant on our aviation industry. And once we reach a stage where we can welcome residents from more countries around the world back into Scotland, it will be vitally important that our aviation industry is ready and waiting for their arrival, whilst keeping Scotland safe from the threat of coronavirus. 
And that's why it's important to get testing right as soon as possible. So we need to see urgent action on airport testing. At First Minister's Questions just last week, Ruth Davidson highlighted the need for airport testing after recent figures showed that only 5% of people who were coming into our airports had been contacted by the National Contact Tracing Centre. And airport bosses are warning that thousands of job losses were on the cards if there was no mandatory testing at airports, with a firm AGS Airports, which operates Glasgow and Aberdeen, stating that they cannot operate in such unpredictable environments. And my local airport of Aberdeen knows the importance of testing, with DICE Airport being used by the UK government to provide additional testing facilities. And with Aberdeen as the busiest helicopter terminal in the world, I know they'll be keen to get on top of the testing regime so they can help reduce the spread of coronavirus. So the aviation industry is willing for this change, but the Scottish Government need to help them achieve it, and soon. And whilst Nicola Sturgeon stated last week that airport testing regimes were ongoing, I, like many, remain sceptical. Because the aviation industry are no stranger to broken promises by the SNP. They promised to cut air departure tax by 50%, but the SNP broke that promise. And considering pre-coronavirus research showed that Scotland could get up to 20 new connections if this tax was abolished, it seems even more counterproductive now to continue with the stance of not cutting ADT when we should be finding ways to boost our aviation industry. So perhaps it is time for the Labour to join the Scottish Conservatives in our calls for a reduction in air departure tax. Now, I know the SNP rejected reducing ADT on climate change grounds, but given the reduction in flights in this pandemic, perhaps this should be reassessed. And moreover, our policy is for a long-haul cut, which avoids undermining surface travel alternatives, such as cars and trains. So we're not suggesting reducing the domestic rate, and we continue to promote green alternatives to travelling within the UK, such as hydrogen technology and the electrification of rail lines. And in addition to this, the UK government is to publish a strategy through to 2025, which will address concerns such as the return of growth to the sector, workforce skills, regional connectivity and freight, consumer issues, climate change, decarbonisation, health, safety, security, and the role that UK aviation brings in retaining the nobles, nation's global reach. Now, for my final point, I'd like to note that the airports could also take small steps in assisting the industry, for example, parking charges. So in a time when we want to reduce barriers to encourage people back into businesses, I do believe that a review of airport parking charges could entice users to their airports once more. For example, a user of Dice Airport can come from as far afield as Dundee, Braemar or Keith, all with a longer travelling time than some flights to Aberdeen. And this means that for those travelling to pick up family or friends, they can be faced with expensive parking charges on upon arrival after finding out that a flight may have been delayed. So I know this is going to be an issue, this is an issue at airports across the country, and I hope members will join me in asking for airports to reconsider their parking charges to help those who are doing all they can to save money during a time when we are facing another recession. So there's much that can be done to help the avian industry get back on its feet again, but our Scottish Government must do what they can, and they can start by cutting ADT and sorting out a proper airport testing regime. Thank you. The last contribution in the open debate is from John Mason. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful uh, to be able to take part in today's debate. Aviation is a subject which impacts hugely on the Scottish economy and has a major influence on all our major statistics, like tourism, uh, around unemployment potentially, and so on. But it's also a local and individual issue, and I've had constituents contact me in recent months about their own jobs, their terms and conditions uh, with employers such as the airports, the airlines and the airport service businesses. I believe aviation has a strong future in Scotland. The pandemic is not going to last forever. So sure, sure, we, do want, sorry, sure we do want to go back, we do not want to go back to exactly what we did previously. And aviation does have an environmental impact, which I will mention later. But flying is a big factor in many of our lives, whether that be for having to fly uh, because of work commitments, uh, going to visit family in distant locations, or perhaps going for an annual holiday overseas. 
And of course, we want tourists to come to Scotland to benefit from our scenery and history and to boost our economy and create jobs. Now, I know... Uh, yes? Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. Uh, he rightly points to some of the issues that there are uh, around the environment and around the economy. Will he also, I'm sure, want to acknowledge um, that the existence of lifeline uh, flights in the islands of Scotland that are just exactly what the name suggests, they do make the difference between local economies being viable and not? John Mason. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I was going to mention uh, Logan Air uh, later on as an example, I think a, be a better example, perhaps, uh, of how they've kept operating uh, through the, the pandemic. Uh, I know that some of these trips that we've mentioned uh, could be done without flying, and I personally have done Hong Kong to Glasgow by rail. Uh, however, realistically... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad I got the reaction, thank you. Um, however, realistically, we cannot all do that on a regular basis. Flying is, flying is necessary and it will recover. To look, I'll do a, a separate speech on that. To look at some of the detail of the Labour motion, I have to say first that there's a lot I can agree with. Firstly, that job retention uh, of the furlough scheme has been hugely important and I'm very pleased that Westminster introduced it and even kept it going longer than was first expected. Yes, of course, there have been gaps in it from day one, but on the whole, it has prevented the kind of instant mass unemployment that many of us feared. And it is true that some sectors of the economy are getting back to something closer to normal, but that is not true of all sectors. And aviation is definitely one of these sectors. So as others have said, we really need a continuation of the furlough scheme, albeit probably more targeted than before. There is then mention of Scottish and UK governments providing direct support to the sector. And again, that is not contentious in broad terms, I think. However, when it comes to the actual money and resources for this, we have to be realistic. Virtually all of the business support so far has come from UK borrowing. Now, clearly that kind of level of borrowing cannot be continued indefinitely, but given the low interest rates at present, I have no problem with some, some more short-term borrowing, both in order to target more support at sectors like aviation and to give the economy in general a boost at this time. However, as things stand, that support has to come from Westminster. The Scottish Government can and has tweaked the funding received to make it more suitable for the Scottish context. And it has also been able to add a bit more money here and there. But if we are talking more about more borrowing, that has to be at a Westminster level. A just transition to a green economy is also mentioned in the Labour motion, and Patrick Harvey has spent quite a lot of time on that. And again, I am fully supportive of that. Many of us have felt that level of flying uh, that we as a Western society were doing before the pandemic was unjustifiably high. Yes, planes are quieter and more fuel efficient than they used to be. However, as we seek to pull more people out of poverty in this country and around the world, I do not believe the environment can afford to have ever increasing numbers of flights, whether for business or leisure. I understand that in 2019, there were 4.5 billion scheduled passengers flying throughout the world, which is slightly over one flight for every two people. So it looks like some of us need to cut back, uh, very briefly, I think. Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you for joining Mason to giving way. Um, I wondered if the member thought that given the, what we believe is the collapse of the industry, I spoke to many business people in Glasgow who actually fear that Glasgow Airport potentially might not have a future if we don't act. I just wondered if that was a concern to the member and would, would he address the question of whether double testing would give people, or do you think this, this is really the way to plan a way out of a disaster? I, I think I, I was, I'm really concentrating on the finance and the, and the economy background because that is my background uh, f today. But I mean, I, th I think we've had a pretty clear answer from the government. I am sympathetic and I think the government is sympathetic to what Pauline McNeill is asking for. If it is possible, if it's safer, but I mean, it appears that at the moment the, qu the quarantine system is the safest system. Anyway, uh, so it does look like we all need to cut back on flying in order to give uh, others more chance and in order to prevent the overall total number of flights increasing rapidly again. So when replying to constituents working in the aviation sector, and while I do take up their cases with their individual employers, I always try and point out to them 
that the aviation sector needs to reduce in size in the longer term, uh, but absolutely there must be a just transition to all those affected. All, all of the part about working with the sector and the trades unions in the Labour motion seems fine to me. To be fair to both unions and individual employees I have been in touch with, they have all been open to temporary measures like reduced hours or job sharing to minimise redundancies, and that is very welcome. But I fully agree that some employers have been unfairly trying to use the situation to reduce costs, terms and conditions. And when we had an online briefing from Close, Unite the please. Union, it seemed clear that some employers were behaving better than others in the sector. I realise I have to cut out a little bit here. Uh, I was going to mention uh, Logan Air, who I think have sadly had to uh, cut 68 uh, could you close, please? out of 850 staff, which is better than some. But in conclusion, I believe aviation can and must have a bright future, but we do need the UK Government to intervene in the short to medium term. Thank you. We move to the closing speeches. Uh, Patrick Harvey for up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much again, Presiding Officer. Let's begin with some points of agreement, because there, there are some. The, the furlough scheme has had a critical role in protecting jobs. And even if that's ended in general, which I would not welcome, specific sectors do need continued support. I hope that even the strongest critic of the aviation industry would want that support for the workforce and for people whose livelihoods are being lost or remain at risk. Michael Matheson and Colin Smith both made that point, as did many others. Another point of agreement that our remote and rural, especially island communities, have a special need for aviation to stay connected with the rest of Scotland, let alone the wider world. Sarah Boyack and Alistair Allen were among those mentioning this. And also, that both the response to the immediate crisis and the development of a just transition plan must be the result of dialogue and cooperation with the unions representing the people whose jobs are at stake, uh, a point made by Polly McNeill, among others. There are also some shared concerns, both old and new. There are clearly wider knock-on impacts from the reduced aviation level, including on Scotland's tourism and hospitality businesses. And this is another area where Greens have made the case for years that government policy and the work of agencies like Visit Scotland needs to support positive change, placing a much higher priority on domestic tourism and surface travel routes. Whether it's strikes, terrorism, volcanoes, or a, a new, now a global pandemic, we know that aviation is subject to unpredictable changes. It's also clear, and I hope becoming more widely understood now, that climate change itself, the environmental damage that the aviation industry has helped to cause, is closely connected to the risk of new pandemic diseases. We are probably entering a time when such disruptions will increase and fewer people around the world will treat aviation as casually as some have done in recent years. So there's the common ground, I hope. But there are, of course, differences too. I don't think Michael Matheson, in his opening speech, made any reference at all to the need for a just transition plan for aviation. He didn't reflect on the First Minister's view that we need to fly less, but instead spent part of his speech talking with enthusiasm about new routes. I'd ask if he could confirm in his closing speech whether he agrees with Nicola Sturgeon's comments in the Channel 4 climate debate which acknowledged that aviation levels at that time were too high. The Cabinet Secretary did argue for achieving aviation growth in a way that ensures environmental impact is mitigated. And others, like Alex, uh, like Alex Cole Hamilton, uh, talked about greener aviation. It really does appear that some people take on face value the empty promises of the industry itself, which has never offered a coherent, or convincing plan for cutting emissions while increasing flight numbers. Pauline McNeill said, we all sign up for the idea that we should take fewer flights. I, I hope she's right. I wish she was. But I'm not sure we all do sign up to that. Certainly, those trying to revive the absurd plan to cut aviation tax don't agree. I don't think Graham Simpson does either. He told us, if Scotland wants to connect to the world, we rely on aviation. Well, I'm not going to compete with a, a rail trip from Glasgow to Hong Kong, though my, my transatlantic uh, trip by cargo freighter that came about as close as I've ever managed. But most of Europe is easily accessible by rail. This parliament, proud of its climate change targets, still treats aviation as the default option. 
So the question is, how much do we rely on aviation? Even before COVID, the Greens have never argued for grounding all the planes or digging up the runway. But we have said over-reliance on aviation and the assumption that aviation could just keep growing forever was unsustainable. Far from signing up to the idea of flying less, we have, as a society, been flying ever more. And we have come to treat aviation as an entirely casual thing, as though it does no harm at all. So we have a responsibility now in this context to ask how immediate support for people whose jobs at risk and any recovery plan for the industry can be done consistently within environmental limits. And I think that responsibility falls to all of us because it simply won't happen with assumptions about technologies that don't even make sense on the drawing board yet. It won't happen without a change in our social attitudes to aviation. And much of the public already acknowledges this. The uh, Citizens' Assembly on Climate, set up by six Westminster committees, published its report last week showing 80% support for a frequent flyer levy to reduce environmental impact and recognise the economic inequality of access to aviation. If I heard right, Pauline McNeill also made a special case for short-haul flights from Glasgow to London and called for a jobs-first approach. Well, we should not be willing to abandon the people or the communities whose livelihoods are being lost, but we would be failing them more if we pretended that business as usual will return or that recovery means going back to the way things were. Those of us arguing for an end to humanity's systematic destruction of the world around us have been told year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, that economic growth must come first. It does seem through this debate that it's still only the Greens who are willing to challenge fatal ideology. Thank you, President House. Marjorie Fraser, please, for up to six minutes. Thank you, thank you um, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, thanking uh, the Labour Party for bringing this debate to the Chamber? It's been actually quite a constructive uh, debate, and I'm sure given all that's been happening in the Labour Party this week, they've welcomed the chance to unite around an issue uh, for once. Uh, long may that continue. Um, the scale of the problem facing aviation was outlined by a number of speakers. Colin Smith at the start talked about 5,000 jobs at risk. Graham Simpson talked about job cuts at Virgin Atlantic, at Logan Air, at EasyJet uh, and uh, at BA. And what we do know is that passenger numbers are down, an estimated 80% at Aberdeen and Glasgow airports. Edinburgh Airport, which uh, Alex Cole Hamilton referred to, they're down uh, almost the same amount, 79%. And there's a huge economic impact on this. Direct employment at airports is, is affected. But also there's a huge knock-on effect on the wider economy. Uh, and Morris Golden and Neil Bibby referred to the job losses at uh, Rolls-Royce uh, in their area. There's a, a knock-on effect on, on ancillary services affecting aviation. The people who uh, produce the food people eat uh, on airlines, the people who do the, the cleaning of the planes, the people who uh, service the airport, work in airport shops, work in uh, bars and restaurants, the taxis, the uh, providers of transport, the travel agents. There's a huge knock-on effect uh, on uh, the, the, the wider economy. Uh, and Michel Ballantyne and others talked about the wider impact on tourism because we need people flying into Scotland to support our tourist economy. So the scale of the challenge is enormous. And I think there were three key uh, issues that were raised in this debate uh, where there are potential solutions. The first is direct government support. Now, uh, we talked about uh, the UK government support. We talked about the furlough scheme, uh, which I know we're discussing in more detail tomorrow. The, among the most generous furlough schemes in the world, supporting more than a half a million jobs uh, in the Scottish economy. And I think we have to accept the furlough scheme cannot go on forever. But nevertheless, businesses will need support after the end of October, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer has already acknowledged that point. But there's also a role here for the Scottish Government too. And, you know, it's not good enough for SNP members just to stand up, as they have done in this debate, and say it's only ever up to the UK Government to take action. We know that the UK Government have given the Scottish Government £6.5 billion guaranteed in additional money in this financial year. Has all that money been spent? We don't know. Oh. Mr. Forbes, can, Ms, Ms, Mr. Forbes, I'm sorry. Ms. Forbes can give me the answer to the question I asked three weeks ago and didn't get an answer to. Where's the money gone? Well, Kate Forbes. I just wanted 
confirmation that Murdo Fraser re recognises that the only part of the UK to ensure that there was rates relief for the aviation sector was here in Scotland. Yeah. Murdo Fraser. Ms Forbes has still not answered my question, which I asked her three weeks ago, which is, has all the money been spent, all the £6.5 billion, pounds, uh, and where has it gone? And hopefully we'll get an answer to that uh, very soon. The second uh, area that needs to be addressed, uh, and is touched in our amendment, is the question of air passenger duty or air departure tax, and Alex Burnett referred to this in his comments. And a number of people, including this Scottish Passenger uh, uh, Agents Association uh, and Edinburgh Airport, have called for an APD suspension for six months. Now, APD, of course, is still reserved. It's still reserved, despite being devolved under the Scotland Act 2016. Indeed, this Parliament passed the Air Departure Tax Act in 2017, but still the Scottish Government has not taken up that particular power. And it's a real irony, Deputy Presiding Officer, because they're always demanding more economic levers, but when the UK Government actually gives them an economic lever, they don't want to take that on. Uh, well, not just now, I need to make some progress. And I remember Fergus Ewing, I remember sitting on panels with Fergus Ewing for years, when he was demanding the APD be cut. It needs to be cut to help the tourist industry, he would say, and the UK government needs to devolve, need to stop dragging their feet, he would say, and devolve it to us so we can cut it. And of course, now they don't even want it to be passed to them. They're all words and no action when it comes to these economic levers, presiding officer. And the third and final point I want to talk about uh, is the issue of testing. And quite a number of members spoke about this, Graham Simpson did, and both Polly McNeill and Sarah Boyack made some very uh, powerful contribution on the whole question of testing and the question of, of quarantine. And it is a fact, Graham Simpson made this point, quarantine is putting people off flying because nobody wants to have to quarantine for 14 days uh, when uh, they come home. And the uncertainty around that is also putting people off flying because the, the regulations change on a day-by-day -day and week-by-week -week basis, and therefore people don't want to make that commitment to fly, not knowing how they will be affected. We could mitigate against the issue of quarantine with better uh, testing. We are not at the present delivering testing uh, on arrival, and fewer than 5% of those in quarantine at present are getting a follow-up call. So I absolutely agree with those who've been calling for better Airport testing is done in more than 30 other countries around the world, uh, and it could be done here if we put our mind to it. And I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary had to say around that and the initial steps that are being taken to try and address that issue. Because I think that, above all the other interventions, that is the one that actually could make a real difference to restoring the confidence in people who actually want to travel. Uh, and that also needs to be linked with a proper following up in uh, quarantine. I'm conscious of the time, uh, presiding officer, so I will just sum up very briefly the three key issues, uh, financial support uh, from governments, both the UK government and the Scottish government, uh, looking at how we review air passenger duty and affecting, uh, looking at the tax burden and better airport testing. If we can agree on these things that need to be done, this will have been a very constructive and useful debate. Thank you. Jamie Hepburn for up to six minutes, please, Minister. Hey, thank you very much, President Officer, and uh, was, as others have done, can I also uh, thank Colin Smith for uh, bringing forward uh, today's uh, debate. I want to uh, start from a, a point of consensus. I think uh, the debate this afternoon has shown that we, as a parliament, have a broad understanding and recognition of the scale of the impact that COVID-19 has had on the global aviation industry. Uh, at the outset, uh, I want to be clear with members, especially those who represent the areas in which Scotland's airports are located, and particularly I want to make clear to those they represent, those who work in the aviation sector or who rely on the aviation sector, the Scottish Government understands and recognises the depth of the challenge that the aviation sector faces. And indeed, in our own amendment, that's why we have said that we recognise the need for the Scottish and UK governments to provide direct support to the sector through this period to protect uh, jobs. And just picking up on the point that's been made by uh, a number of members, particularly on the uh, Labour uh, benches around uh, the necessity for us looking at conditionality in these matters, uh, our amendment does go on further to say that we believe that support should include appropriate protections for jobs and fair working conditions, very much building on the Fair Work First uh, agenda that we already have in uh, play. Uh, there should uh, be a recognition, though, that there are 
uh, no quick fixes for uh, the sector. Uh, Graeme Simpson, I thought, said something interesting in his opening uh, remarks. Uh, he said that lo lockdown was a political uh, choice. I I'm unclear whether or not he recognised the necessity of that choice having to be made, but uh, indeed I suppose in some sense he is uh, correct, but of course it was a choice that had to be made to save people's lives. There's no greater responsibility for any government than that. But even if we hadn't made those political uh, decisions, that decision to have lockdown, the idea that there would be no impact on the aviation sector is a, wishful, is a form of wishful uh, thinking, because this is an international and global uh, challenge. We see travel restrictions around the world, and until uh, they are lifted, uh, then we are going to see some uh, difficulties. So the question is how we best uh, respond. And we do need to look at the actions uh, we can uh, take uh, here as the Scottish Government, but also with the UK Government as well. And I am pleased that many members agree with our representations to the UK Government to extend the job retention scheme. That's not just important, of course, for Scotland's airports, but for our economy as a whole. And indeed, today is an opposite day to uh, remind ourselves that just today, uh, the Scottish Government's Chief Economist has published research, research showing that extending the furlough scheme for just eight months could reduce unemployment in Scotland by 61,000 through the first half of next year. So I say uh, to Michelle Ballantyne, that is why the necessity of considering the extension of the furlough scheme is something that has to be given very serious consideration. Very briefly, I don't have much time. David Stewart. The Minister mentioned representations to the UK Government. What representation has the Scottish Government made to the UK Government asking for a public service obligation for the Wick to Edinburgh route? Jamie Hepburn. I, I congratulate the member on getting on the record again the issue of the public service obligation. I think the point has already been made that there is a business case being made by uh, Keith in this Chamber of Commerce and it is being uh, considered. Anyway, the point I was making about the furlough scheme is today is a chance for Parliament to demonstrate that it, it believes the scheme should be extended because it's laid out in our amendment uh, that that is something that should uh, take place. I'm afraid that I don't have time, uh, Ms Ballantyne, otherwise I, I would have. I want to touch on the issue of, uh, of quarantine uh, because that was picked up by a number of uh, uh, members. Uh, I think the, the first uh, point I would make is that this, of course, is a decision that has been informed by clinical and scientific advice. It is, by our estimation, the best measure by which we can respond to the threat of the spread of COVID-19. Uh, of course, though, we keep the measures under uh, constant review as changes occur here and in other uh, countries. Uh, but that will always be done on the basis of the advice uh, given to us. But a number of members asked and requested that we continue to look at these matters in conjunction with testing. And of course, that is something that we commit to do. And again, I would refer members to our uh, amendment where we conclude that we will explore the potential for alternative mo measures, including testing. And indeed, the point made by Michael Matheson in his opening uh, remarks uh, around the proposition that will be considered in conjunction with Scotland's airports. It's unfortunate that I don't have time to update members on the considerable range of work that's underway in relation to responding to the challenges that the aerospace sector uh, faces. If members want to contact me directly uh, on that matter, I'll be happy to update them on the work that the group has undertaken, not through the two or three times we've met that Willie Coffey suggested, the six times that the group has met. I'll be happy to update any member with an interest. But today, uh, President Officer, I hope that the Parliament will unite around the amendment we presented, which takes on board the fundamental points being made, of course, in the original uh, motion that's been laid by Colin Smith, but of course also makes the point that the UK Government must extend that furlough scheme, which is so important for aviation here in Scotland, but our entire economy as well. Call Jackie Bailey to wind up the debate for up to seven minutes, please.
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and let me start by welcoming the contributions to this debate. There were a number of key themes that have been discussed, the importance of the aviation sector to employment and to our economy, and how we protect passengers and, of course, jobs. But Colin Smith was right to remind us that COVID-19 has not gone away, and until we have a vaccination, restrictions on our everyday lives will be with us for some time to come. So in that context, we need to take continued action to deal with the pandemic but urgent action now to deal with an impending economic crisis. The aviation sector is synonymous with travel and tourism. When we think about the sector, I certainly think of holidays and sunshine as we visit the rest of the world. And of course, the many visitors who come from abroad to visit Scotland, contributing substantially to our economy. But it is also, as other members have said, about cargo, delivering important supplies like PPE, keeping our shelves fully stocked. It is genuinely concerning that the aviation industry continue to suffer until people feel comfortable to travel abroad again, both for business and indeed for pleasure. So employees at every level of the aviation industry, from pilots to baggage handlers, face widespread uncertainty with new redundancies being announced almost every day. And it's not just the airlines and airports that are struggling. Off-site support services providing catering and cleaning are affected too. The maintenance of aircraft, and as Neil Bibby has said, we have already seen 700 redundancies announced at Rolls-Royce in Inchinnan. We know the impact on tourism businesses. The cancellation of the Edinburgh Festival alone has cost the economy £1 billion, never mind the impact on travel agents and hotels. And as a number of members have mentioned, analysis by the Fraser of Allender Institute for Unite the Union has predicted that proposed job losses in the Scottish civil aviation and aerospace engineering sectors may cause the loss of up to 5,000 jobs in Scotland alone, with an associated 715 million loss in economic output and 320 million loss in GVA. The impact on our economy as a whole is likely to be much, much greater than that. The 11 billion for inbound, inbound tourism, the almost 1.7 billion in outbound tourism, all of that will have an impact. The aviation industry needs urgent sector-specific support. We need the Scottish and UK governments to work together alongside trade unions, employees, and representatives from the industry. Because only by doing that will we ensure that the support being provided is effective and is targeted? Do you know, it is simply not enough for the Cabinet Secretary to call on the UK Government or simply to write to the UK Government. He needs to roll his sleeves up and do something now. Any, any future financial support should include protection for jobs and working conditions. There are long-term changes needed to tackle the climate emergency. Of course there are, to ensure a sustainable future. But to be honest, the immediate focus must be on saving jobs because the industry is facing collapse. But let me return to the protection for jobs and working conditions because uh, the no more firing and rehiring proposal made by Gavin Newlands is to be welcomed. Keir Starmer has made clear the Labour Party's support for that bill, but what a shame that it is not matched by action by the Scottish Government here. The SNP have an opportunity, a real opportunity, to ensure that the support they provide for the industry is conditional on fair employment. Will the Cabinet Secretary tell us now whether he will do so? Michael Matheson. I appreciate the member for giving way. She will recognise that the key areas of law that relate to fire and rehire. Mr. Matheson, would UK, you speak nearer your night? I reserve, I reserve to the UK government. But what I can assure the member is that we will do everything we can to make sure that workers' rights are respected. And we've pursued that already with the aviation sector. But I hope she will support us in devolving employment law to this parliament. Yeah. Jackie can Bailey. I, can I say there was an abject you know, excuse? 
for not doing anything now, for not taking, not taking the opportunity that is presented by providing support, but making that support conditional. You can do it, you should get on with it. Because, presiding officer, the scale of redundancies to come is breathtaking. There will be tens of thousands of jobs that will be lost. It will be as nothing like we have seen before. And if you need any more convincing, then look at the Airport Operators Association figures. They say passenger traffic is down 98 to 99 percent on this time last year. ABTA, who represent travel agents and tour, tour operators, estimate that up until the end of May, about 3.5 million atoll protected bookings were impacted, worth a figure of some £7 billion. So understanding the scale of the impending crisis is one thing, but where is that sense of urgency? And Pauline McNeill was absolutely right to talk about the real urgency for the Scottish Government to intervene and fast, because it is becoming too late. Can I suggest that the Cabinet Secretary does call an urgent meeting with the aviation sector trade unions, GMB and Unite, to discuss targeted support for the industry, because so far that's not been done. Let me turn to quarantine, mentioned by many members across the chamber. We need an urgent review of the existing quarantine system. Scottish Government need to bring forward options for a robust regime of airport testing. Testing travellers as they arrive in Scotland, backed up by following testing at home, does provide a degree of reassurance. It's not the only option available. The Government can consider the case in 30 countries across the world. Iceland, Ireland, Germany. Let's learn from from their approach and put something in place now. The Scottish Government has in fact changed its guidance on quarantining a total of 19 times, on average once every 3.6 days. Do it again, put in a testing regime that allows the economy to reopen and keeps passengers safe. Finally, presiding officer, let me say again, there is much that the Scottish Government can do. Don't just call on or write to the UK government. We need you to work together, not engage in megaphone diplomacy. Roll your sleeves up, get on with it. Deliver a package of support with conditions attached to protect jobs and deliver a robust testing regime. We've heard about the tens of thousands of jobs at Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Inverness and beyond and the billions of pounds they contribute to the Scottish economy. Presiding officer, let me finish by expressing my very real anger at the comments of the SNP MSP who represents Glasgow Airport. It is disgraceful that he described this as a pointless academic debate. Shame on him, because this debate is about an impending economic crisis. This is a debate about saving the aviation sector, and this is about saving jobs and livelihoods. His comments were ill-considered, and he should really apologise to many of his constituents that might lose their job at Glasgow Airport. Point of order, George Adam. I would just like to make a point of order on some of the comments that Jackie Bailey made there. That was not... I would ask if she would look at the actual... Please, please, would the chamber quieten down I would and want, let me hear whether, in fact, we have I would, a point of I would order. Want, I would, Mr Adam, stop speaking until it's quiet. There's no point. <laughs> Thank you. George Adam. I would ask that Jackie Bailey looks at the official report and then if there's an apology to be made, I'm willing to accept it. I'm well aware that that wasn't a point of order. Thank you, Mr Mountain. However, uh, the member has um, put the record as he would wish it and both Miss Bailey and Mr Adam can decide how to go forward from here. So that the debate was concluded uh, on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19 and it's now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 22725 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on the Minister Graham Day to move the motion. Move, President Officer. No member has asked to speak on the motion. The question is therefore that motion 22725 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is agreed. 
The next item of business is consideration of business motion 22727 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the stage one timetable of a bill. Move, I presume, officer. <laughs> Perhaps I should have called on Graham Day to move the motion. <laughs> Just for the record and properly, can I call on Graham Day to move that motion, please? Moved. Thank you very much. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I would ask Graham Day, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 22728 on approval of an SSI and 22729 on committee membership. Move, President Officer. The question in these motions will be put at decision time. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. And I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Michael Matheson is agreed, the amendment in the name of Graham Simpson will fall. The first question is that amendment 22711.3 in the name of Michael Matheson, which seeks to amend motion 22711 in the name of Colin Smith on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. There is a division. Therefore, I'll suspend proceedings for a short break to allow members to access the digital voting system and we'll wait for broadcasting to cease. Thank you.
We will now restart proceedings. The first question is that Amendment 22711.3 in the name of Michael Matheson, which seeks to amend Motion 22711 in the name of Colin Smith on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19, be agreed. And members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 22711.3 in the name of Michael Matheson is yes, 54, no, 60, and there were no abstentions. Not agreed. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed to. <laughs> The next question is that Amendment 22711.1 in the name of Graham Simpson, which seeks to amend Motion 22711 in the name of Colin Smith on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is not agreed and we will move to a vote. Okay. Members should cast their votes now. When we have a pause at this point, it's generally to make sure that um, people have been able to vote and can raise points of order accordingly if they haven't. I therefore have a point of order from Elaine Smith.
Thank you, President Officer. Uh I'm afraid the, uh, the connection for Ms Smith has dropped out. I understand that she wished to raise a point of order to say she was voting no. However, without her doing that, I can't include... She has now come back. <laughs> so, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I raise a point of order? I wish to vote no. Okay. The result of the vote in Amendment Number 2711.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes, 29. <laughs> You can have confidence in the voting system, but perhaps not in the Deputy Presiding Officer. Ah, they don't even look alike. <laughs> Sorry. Third time lucky. The result of the vote in amendment number 22711.1. In the name of Graham Simpson is yes, 29, no, 86, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 22711.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey which seeks to amend motion 22711 in the name of Colin Smith on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their vote now.
Point of order, Alex Cole. I tried to vote, but was unable to. So, but my vote would have been no. It's noted. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hammond. <laughs> Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I uh, wish to vote no, as my vote is not being recorded. Thank you. That's noted, Ms. Smith. Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I also had no opportunity to vote. I would like to vote no. Thank you, Ms. Todd. That's noted. The clerks have been accordingly directed to record all of these votes, which will be included in what I read to the Chamber. The result of the vote on Amendment 22711.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes, 6, no, 109, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 22711 in the name of Colin Smith on sustainable aviation beyond COVID-19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, and therefore there is a division, and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 22711 in the name of Colin Smith, yes, 54, no, 61, and there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. And we'll move on. Uh, I propose to ask a single question on the two parliamentary bureau motions. If any member objects, please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 22728 and 22729, in the name of Graham Day, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, be agreed. Are we all agreed? That is therefore agreed and concludes decision time. We'll now move on to the members' business, and I would ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so quietly and observe social distancing, please.